Well, <laughs> first, first of all, thank you everybody for uh, braving the storm, the rain, and everything else. Thank you, Andrew, for getting all the way up here from. You're down in. Uh, I'm in Vero Beach. In Vero wow. Beach, which is quite a haul. So, yeah. um, so thank you for the, taking the sure. time and coming up here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you because they okay. to hear me. Okay, fantastic, fantastic. Um, yeah, as you said, I'm from uh, I'm from Vero Beach, um, Fort Pierce. If you guys aren't familiar with Vero Beach, Fort Pierce is uh, the next um, kind of big city um, near where we're at. Um, uh, I, I am a kayak guide, but um, guiding is sort of secondary um, for me. I'm a tournament angler first. Um, my family's actually in grapefruit, and that's how I pay the bills. But um, I, uh, I love the tournament fish. So um, uh, the, what we're going to go through today is the um, hopefully the uh, some tips and tricks that will help the you guys become the 10% that, uh, that, that catch 90% of the fish, not the 90% that only catch 10% of the fish. Um, some of the things that I'm going to talk about are um, maybe tournament specific sort of things, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to help you in a normal day of, uh, of fishing become a more, um, more efficient angler. Um, I've got about two hours. Um, and uh, as I said on Facebook, if you guys are ready in those posts, I talk like a fire hydrant. It just comes out, you know, steady. So you're going to have to stop me um, if it's time to take a break or if we need to do, um, you know, an intermission or, or something like that. Um, utilizing um, uh, the Power, uh, Power Pro pre presentation um, is sort of new. Um, this is a brand new presentation that I put together. Um, if you see something that doesn't make any sense or if there's an obvious typo or grammar or spelling error, point it out to me. You know, it'll, it'll help, help me be better you know, in, in, the, in the future. So um, uh, with that said, um, the, I have a kayak team called the Grass Flats Mafia. Um, I fished as a family team uh, for years and years, and my son and I now fish as, as a team. Um, it's just he and I. So you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, um, everywhere on the web as Grass Flats Mafia. It's grassflatsmafia.com. Um, I do have a website dedicated for um, my, uh, my guiding, but this is more for uh, tournaments and updates as to what we're doing, where we're going to be, uh, the seminars, you know, and things like that. I do about six seminars a year. Um, last year I did one at um, Kayaks by Bow over in uh, Titusville. I did an offshore se seminar there. I've got a sort of a kayak fishing 101. I also have one that's specific called dissecting the flats. We're going to touch on that a little bit um, at the end of this program today, but the one that's dedicated to dissecting the flats is much more in depth on taking maps and charts and uh, even Google Earth and uh, being able to read those, you know, those waters to, to, be, to make you more pr productive. We're going to do a little bit of that today, but just not quite as in depth as the, as the full program. Uh, and I have to mention, um, for legal reasons, uh, uh, the uh, Grassflats Mafia logo is a registered trademark. Um, this program is also uh, copyrighted. Anything that I say, it's intellectual property, all the images here, all the normal kind of stuff. You can't take the information that I use here and develop your own. So, yeah, exactly. So. Okay, let me give you a little bit of an in introduction. I'm a Florida native. I've lived here. I'm 46 years old, I hate to say. Lived here all my life. I grew up in Lakeland. Um, I spent my, most of my adult life in Pensacola, and I've been in Vero for quite a number of years now. So I've had the opportunity to fish all three coasts um, you know, in, in Florida. Um, 1986, I see a lot of you guys have probably been fishing since, since 1986, but a few may not even been around in 1986. Um, I, I fished my first tournament in 1986 and just fell in love with the camaraderie and the, and the competition. Um, I fished on the SKA Pro Tour, which is a Southern Kingfish Association that's the big boats fishing for kingfish. Um, I was a member of the uh, Mobile Big, big Game Fishing Club, the Pensacola Big Game Fish, Fishing Club, so I did a lot of uh, big game uh, fishing tournaments as well. Um, I raised two boys um, in, in fishing tournaments, so we did everything. In the panhandle, they call them rodeos, and that's everything from pin fishing croakers all the way up to marlin, all in one, you know, one tournament. So we fished a lot of rodeos and things. Um, I've held uh, seven IGFA um, uh, line class records. Um, I've been a captain for three. Um, both of my boys each have held an IGFA uh, world, world record. Um, uh, I started kayak fishing only about five years ago, so I'm relatively new in the kayak, but it's the same fish, it's the same gear, it's the same techniques. Translating it into kayak fishing has helped me be successful on the tournament trail, and that's really what I love to do is, you know, is tournament fish. I fish mainly uh, redfish tournaments, but I've gotten into bass fishing this year. This is my first uh, full-time year of, uh, of fishing um, uh, bass tournaments. And I was lucky enough on one series to be um, ranked number one angler of the year for a while, and I've kind of fallen off a little bit yet. But um, another one of our local anglers, she's from Stewart, Florida. She's still ranked, I think, third um, angler of the year. So we've got a local, you know, and that's a national circuit as well. Alabama, Texas, Pennsylvania, 
<coughs> South Carolina. The Nationals will be in um, Lake Gunnersville, Alabama. So that's a lot of fun. So it's not just a saltwater fishing, it's bass fishing as well. And I found that my saltwater fishing translates well into my bass fishing, and I'm learning some things in the bass fishing that are helping me in my saltwater fishing as well. Um, I've been lucky enough with the experiences that I've had throughout my life um, to have 60 podium finishes and 40 top tens uh, in the kayak world. Done that in five years, so I, I'm pretty proud about, about that. Um, that's not the I like me section. I just want you guys to realize that the, the tips and things that I'm going to talk about is coming from experience. Um, you know, I, I've got, uh, you know, 30 years experience basically um, tournament fishing, and, I'm, and I've translated that into um, tips and techniques that hopefully is going to help you guys be effective and efficient um, on the water. Uh, this program, again, is called 10% uh, of the anglers catch 90% of the fish. Sometimes they're subtle tips. Sometimes they're not so subtle. Sometimes they're very obvious, but it's things that we forget, uh, we forget to do. Everybody has their own idea of what's the best color, what's the best bait, um, you know, what's the best technique. I use this lure. I only use this brand. That's perfectly fine. That's not to say that if I recommend a bait, a color, a lure, a technique, that that's the end-all, be-all. That's something that I'm really confident with. And the reason that I'm confident with it, hopefully I'm going to be able to convey some science and some physics along that as well. And even if you don't agree that I think that this gold bait with a number eight hook and this, in this particular type of water is the, is the be-all, end-all, if you hear what I have to say and why I believe that, maybe it'll help you with the lures that you have faith in become a little bit more efficient with those, um, with those as well. And if you pick up a few tips, put them in your little tool bag here and there and you remember them, you may just be a little bit more efficient on the water. With me, I've got basically eight hours to, um, to put those fish on the board in order to be successful in, in, at the end of a tournament day. You guys have a weekend or a day or a day off. You want to be incredibly efficient during that course, course of your day and not waste time as well. So it's basically the same thing. All right, now this is something that I'm going to talk about a, a pretty good bit. Being efficient, you've heard me say that already, being effective and being prepared. Now, that sounds like a Boy Scout motto, but this is something that I truly believe. I cannot control what the weather is going to do. I cannot control what the water conditions are going to do. I cannot control whether a redfish is going to stick his nose up and not, not look at one of my baits. I can't control any of that, but I can control anything in my equipment. I can control myself. I can control the clock. I can control my rod and reel. I can control all of my equipment. All of those things I'm going to ensure are as surgical in nature as I possibly can make them and then whatever happens out on the water happens out on the water. But I want to be prepared. I don't want to ever be that guy that says, you know what, I forgot to do this, or I should have sharpened that, or I should have thought about this. I don't want to make those kind of mistakes because there's plenty of other mistakes that I'm going to make during the course of the, course of the day. All right, these are basically the items, the, the highlight items that, um, that I'm going to talk about today. Preparation. Um, essential tools, and everybody's got their favorite um, uh, uh, tools that they like to have on the, um, on the kayak. Rods and reels. Uh, line, knots, electronics. Uh, we're going to talk about our target species and basically I'm going to focus on redfish, trout, and snook because we got, we're right in the middle here where we, we can go to either coast and be able to fish for those three. So I'm going to focus basically on those three, but that's not to say that the other things that I'm going to talk about today won't translate into fishing in the Gulf or fishing in the Atlantic as well. I'm also going to talk about pre-fishing a little bit. Even if you're not a tournament angler, we're going to spend some time before we take that trip, before we have our vacation, or before we take that Saturday and go fishing, we're going to spend a little bit of time on that pre-fishing. The first half a dozen or so items I'm going to run through pretty quickly because I know there's some things that people really want to focus on. Um, lures, hooks as part of, as part of that, um, our pre-fishing, and then of course our dissecting the flats as well. And that's something that we are going to spend a lot more time on is dissecting a flat. Um, as I, again, this is sort of the brief, um, uh, the cliff notes of that, of that program. We are going to talk about wind direction and speed, the water movement, whether it's tidal or um, wind-driven movement or, or, you know, or something like that. Um, Vegetation, we basically have three strong types of vegetation. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't, depending on what, you know, what time of year it is. Um, those three types of vegetation and the depths, whether they're subtle or, um, uh, or, you know, or, more, or direct changes. Preparation. Absolutely believe that the little cliches that are on the board there are absolutely true. If you fail to prepare, then you prepared to fail. Make sure everything is in as good a working order as you can possibly have it. Control the things that you can control because there's going to be so many things that you can't control that are going to happen. But if everything is in the place that it needs to be, you should be able to um, handle any situation um, you know, that comes up. And that has everything to do with you know, from an emergency situation to landing a fish to how do I present a bait when there's a pod of 20 redfish in two feet of water, you know, all of that sort of a thing. 
um, uh, military and police agencies, they practice, 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 you know, to run drills, muscle memory. It's, it's, it's basically the same type of thing. We're wanting to be prepared so that when something hap out of the ordinary happens, we can, um, you know, we can, uh, um, we can adjust to that and, uh, and make, make a success out of it. All right. I truly believe that preparation begins when you get home. As soon as you get home from a fishing trip, and this is something that I did learn from the Boy Scouts. I raised both my boys through the Boy Scouts. As soon as you get home, you lay all your gear out in the garage. You make a pile of stuff you used and the pile of stuff that you didn't use. The stuff that you didn't use, you may not need to carry it next time. When I get home and as soon as I lay a kayak down, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I can fish three or four days a week, I lay that kayak down and I start going through everything, wash it all off. Before I put it in the garage, there's a handful of things that I absolutely do. Did anything break? Did I have a damage to, to any piece of equipment? Which lures did I use? Which things did I take out of the box? Which things may have salt water on them that I'm going to need to rinse? You know, that sort of a thing. Um, one of those things that I, that I do um, that I think is a great tip um, that not, not a lot of people pay attention to with light braid and with light monofilament that we, that we use in these days, a lot of people don't take care to look at the guides on their rod. This is absolutely one of those little tips you need to put in your pocket. Every couple of trips, take a Q-tip or a cotton ball and drag it through your guides. You'll find that you, th there may be a crack or a scratch that you didn't realize was there, but the cotton will catch on it. The tiniest little scratch on 8-pound monofilament or on 10-pound braid can cause a failure that you never knew would happen. Bink, my braid broke and I have no idea why. There must have been a knot. Well, actually, you've got a, a chip and a guide, and that's that, that uh, pressure going back and forth has caused that braid to fail. Um, with your reels, if you've got one that's making a little noise or something like that, now is the time to take that reel apart or have it serviced or something like that. Not the next time you get out on your valuable day off from work on the water and realize, oh, crap, I forgot to do something about this reel. Do it as soon as, or make a note, you know, make some effort as soon as you get off of the water to try to fix it then, not beforehand, because, you know, all, all of us, we procrastinate or we forget or we get lazy, and the next trip out, you know, we've got something that's, uh, you know, that's going to cause a failure. Um, the guys that use braid, you get that little, sometimes you get that funny little knot, and I hate to use the word, but we call them assholes, the little, little knot that's down in there. You know, it's just that one tiny little stupid loop. Get rid of that thing now before you, um, you know, get out on the water, and you've got that 35-inch red of a lifetime on there, and that's where your, you know, your braid pops. So take care of it as soon as, as, soon as you get home. Uh, monofilament, I, I, I go through an awful lot of monofilament. I use both monofilament and braid, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, but I'll, I'll take about maybe 30 yards of my monofilament, and I'll run it through my fingers. And if I find a nick, I'm going to snip it there. I'm not going to take a chance because it may be a money fish you know, or a trophy fish at some point where that nick is going to make a, make a big difference. Um, I keep all the lures that I use during the course of the day. I throw them in a, in a little place in my, um, in my kayak and I don't put them back in the tackle box. I keep them separate because when I get home, I pay special attention and I rinse those guys. I also use, um, it's, I think it's called three in one or three to one oil. Yeah, it's a, it's a little, yeah, it, I, I use that stuff. Um, so I'll, on the lure, on the lures that I've used, I'll take a paper towel and I'll just put a little bit of that oil on those, um, on those lures. For hooks, I've got something else that I do a little bit different that I'll come up in just a few minutes. But we got to think about You've got a stainless steel ring. You've got a carbon steel hook. Those two dissimilar metals cause galvanic corrosion. So even if you rinse the things off with them just sitting in your garage, the hook will actually corrode. Um, you know, those two dissimilar metals, will, you know, will cause that. A little bit of oil will keep that, you know, keep that um, at bay. It's not going to, you know, completely um, eliminate it, but it'll help. No problem with the three in one, the petroleum base. Or? I, I I'll wipe everything off with a paper towel. Yeah. Um, you know, once I once I've oiled it a little bit, I'll wipe it off with a paper towel, and then I'm you know I'm so going. Like vegetable. I'm going fishing with it after that, and yeah, it, 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 it doesn't knock on wood. It hadn't had you know a negative effect yet. So, and I douse everything with a big glop of uh, Procure yeah. anyway, so that you know kind of washes over all those scents. So, all right, we're gonna take a quiz. I'm going to do this a couple of different times because I've got some fish grips that I want to give away. The way that I want to do the quizzes is, is I'm going to ask a question, think about it for a second, and I want you to raise your hand. I don't have real good vision. I may call the first person or the third person who, raise, who raises their hand. Just, just uh, forgive me. So I'm going to, there'll be something on the, on the screen. Um, I'll, I'll have a question to ask. Just raise your hand you know, if, you, um, if you know the answer. All right. This one's a tough one. Okay. Regulations for spotted sea trout are the same throughout the entire state. And I want to I want to know can you tell, get even close to the difference in the regulations? And you were you were first, yes, sir. It's a question of seasons. Uh, it's different on southwest, southeast, and north. You want more specific? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that, um, uh, they're open in 
close at different times. I know that. Um, uh, the size <laughs> too. <laughs> That's to you. How about that? We have four four different regions that we manage for salt water in the, in the state of Florida. Um, the, let me see if my little laser works. Oh yeah. The Southeast and the Southwest, we basically do the same, but for other species, they want to be able to, to be, to be able to split those up. So everything's pretty much the same except, except for the daily bag limit. Yep. Yeah. The, the Northeast, which is basically, um, Jacksonville, um, they're allowed to keep six. Uh, Northwest, which is basically the panhandle, they can keep five. And guys, we can only keep four now? Wow, yeah. that's pretty amazing. Yeah, so I've got one full size and I've got juniors. You want a full size or a junior? I'll pick full size. Okay, you got it. Yes, sir. Awesome. Does the shop here sell um, the fish grip? Yes. Good. Outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, that's, a, that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic product. I absolutely love them. Uh, great product. It's it's all it's plastic and brass, so it never corrodes. It floats with, for a kayak angler. It, you know, is is um, is paramount. So absolutely love the things. Okay, before anybody thinks that I'm some sort of um, OCD, everything has to be perfect. This is my rigging table, right? I mean, it looks like somebody just took a bucket full of fishing crap and threw it on there. So trust me, I am not not OCD. I'm not neat. Obviously, I'm not punctual either, so I just I don't want you guys to think that, oh, this guy's crazy, man. Everything has to be done. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. But again, if you can control it, try to control it because it, it's going to hopefully be, um, be successful on the water. I talked about hooks. It's a little bonus tip. This is a good one to put in your pocket. I got a little Tupperware container that I keep, I don't know, you know, a sixteenth of an inch in the bottom of that three-in-one oil in it. Uh, live bait hooks or my soft plastic hooks, jig heads, things like that. I'll throw in that little plastic container and I'll just leave them. When I need to put some hooks in my tackle box for the next trip, I'll take three or four of those hooks out, I'll dry them off and put them in the tackle box. But that way they're kind of sitting in that oil, you know, the whole time. So, and it's quick and easy and a lazy guy like me, I can just go by and click all my hooks off, you know, off the rods, put them in the little plastic container and, and good to go. All right. The next topic, essential tools. PFD. Everybody knows we've got to have a PFD on the water. Well, that doesn't mean that we can't have an efficient PFD. I prefer an inflatable. I wear this thing. Typically when I do um, my seminars, especially if they're outside, I'll put on my PFD and I'll wear it throughout the entire seminar. By the end of the seminar, people don't even realize I'm wearing the thing. Yeah. I don't know that I'm wearing the thing because I wear it every single time that I'm on the water. Um, it just becomes a part of my, my fishing tools. I like the, um, uh, the inflatable type because it's, there's nothing on the back to bother me as I'm sitting. It's light. It's easy, easy to, to, to wear. If I'm fishing offshore, this one has a nice big pocket on the side. I can put my, my VHF radio. I keep my snips, which I've got included on my essential tools there. Uh, I know you guys are looking up there. I keep pointing here, but we're up there. Um, so I can't go fishing without my PFD because I've got to have my snips. I've got to have some way to be able to cut monofilament and, and braid and that kind of stuff. So I absolutely believe that's, uh, that's an essential tool. Um, does the shop carry snips? Another fantastic, um, you know, great tool. Now, if you're going to cut braid, man, this is, this is the, the best thing for cutting braid. And they last a long time. I can get a year out of, uh, out of one of these things without them uh, corroding. And they're like 13 bucks or something like that. Um, Pliers. I, I, can you guys see what happened to Drew's leg right there? He's got a, um, a treble hook buried up to the curve in there. And when you're out on the kayak by yourself, there's only one way to pull that out, and it's going to be with a pair of pliers. So, um, a pair of pliers. Something else that I think is important is to, ha is to have a knife. You never know when you're going to have an anchor line or a braid that's all tied up in a knot, you know, something like that. Um, some kind of communications. I think when I came in, you guys were talking about fishing offshore. I heard somebody say, talk about, talk about the cell phone, that sort of a thing. Um, with the distances that we travel offshore, and I do a good bit of offshore fishing down around um, Dania, Pompano, you know, I, I fish the Extreme uh, Kayak uh, Tournament Series, just came back from the Bahamas in April fishing that tournament. Um, I carry a VHF radio, but, the, but it's a cell phone, you know, you get reception out for four or five miles, so it's absolutely perfect. And a dry box. Um, I've got a Pelican box, you know, but there's so many manufacturers now that make one of those things. It's so easy to put everything in there. And people joke, they call it my purse because I've got it wherever I go because I keep my wallet, my keys, you know, the, um, the cell phone, everything is in my little, my little box. So um, I think I also heard um, talking about losing stuff overboard. If you love it, leash it. Put some kind of a, um, some kind of a leash on it. Um, my pliers here, I've got a little, um, you know, telephone cord sort of a thing with a, with a hook on it. I can move it from one kayak to another. I clip it off, clip it off to the tackle box or whatever. So it's fantastic. The fish grips, it's the same way. They come with a, um, with a nice little handle. You can, you know, you put through your, um, uh, through your wrist. 
but I got one of the, if this is a rod leash or, or something like that with a clip on the end, now I'm not going to lose my, um, you know, my fish grip. The other thing that I use this fish grip for is I keep it clipped off to the kayak. I'll uh, grab a fish, have him on the, the board if I'm taking a CPR photo or something like that. But I also use this, especially if I'm catching big redfish or big snook or something like that. Once I've got them clipped off and I've done everything that I need to do with that fish, I've got my photographs and all that kind of stuff, I can drop her overboard, let her swim alongside me, make sure she's nice and strong, get her revived, and then when she's ready, I can just unclip her and let her go rather than just, you know, let, let the fish go. So this is, this is a great CPR tool as, as well. So. Okay, let's have a picture of my office. Here we go. And all the I, I fish out of Hobie kayaks, and I, it, I don't care if you if you paddle, pedal, walk on your feet. It, do, it doesn't make any difference. I, it, you know, I I like the I like the Hobies, but uh, I don't think there's any disparity from a tournament standpoint. Guys that paddle and guys that pedal, I think everybody's everybody's pretty even. So it, it doesn't make any difference. Um, everything in all of my kayaks is in is is in basically the exact same place. When you go to your office or when you go to your home office, your monitor is in one place, your mouse is in one place, your stapler is in one place, you know what's in that top drawer, you know where everything is. You can be efficient at your job because you know where everything is at. If you're a mechanic, you know all your box and wrenches are on the top and your screwdrivers are in the next drawer. Same type of a thing. When I get into my kayak, I want to know where everything is so that when I need it, I know exactly where it is. That sounds, it does sound a little OCD and anal, but it just helps me be, you know, be efficient. My pliers, my scent, I've got, of course, my, my laptop being my, um, you know, my, my fish finder. My fish grip is on the side. They're all clipped on. Um, I've got, I keep a rod holder on the left-hand side because I'm handling a fish with my right hand. I want it on the left-hand side. Um, I've got, um, it's a little um, stainless steel paring knife, basically, whether it's a, a Rapala knife or a dive knife or, you know, some sort of a stainless steel knife. It's zip-tied on. Um, my leader material I keep in, the, in this, back, uh, this back pocket and, uh, and a a bottle of bug spray. Each one of my, my kayaks has the same, you know, the same stuff in it. Um, this is a fantastic product, and if you guys aren't carrying them, you should. This is um, tackle webs. Um, it's a mesh, uh, a mesh bag that you just kind of put stuff in, but it's made out of like ballistic nylon, you know, that sort of a thing. Um, uh, they make them with uh, with bungees on them. I took the bungees off, and this thing is basically just zip tied to the back of the seat in my in my Hobie. Um, on my milk crates, they make a size that's perfect that I've got uh, zip tied to the edge of my milk crate. You know, any kind of stuff you know goes you know goes in those little bags. It's that's a, it's a fantastic way to keep um, uh, to keep you know additional loose items. Rods and reels. I don't want to talk about everybody's different preferences as far as rods and reels and that sort of stuff. If you've got a rod, or rod and reel that you love, you like it heavy, you like it light, you're a four pound test guy or you're a 40 pound test guy, that's perfectly fine. I prefer something in the 2,500 to 4,000 size. This is a, this is a 4,000. Um, I, I just happen to prefer, um, you know, Shimano. They make everything from bicycle parts to transmission parts. Anything that has bearings, you know, Shimano has a part of. Absolutely love their, their product. Um, 2,500 size or 4,000 size is plenty. I can catch the biggest fish that swims with the smallest tackle with the right techniques. Seven IGFA records, you know, I, I, know it, I know it can be done. Guys are catching, you know, marlin on four and six pound tests all the time. So you don't necessarily have to have gigantic pieces of equipment um, to be able to, um, uh, to, to fight big fish. But on the flip side of the coin, I typically don't fish for bull reds with four pound tests a lot of stress on those fish you know that's a lot of difficult difficulty on that fish when i was younger and i did you know seek uh, seek those records i i did you know fish for big fish on lighter tackle not so much anymore but if you're if you're seeking line class records or if you want to catch big fish on light tackle yeah it's perfectly fine you know as long as you're taking care of the fish taking care of the resource it's perfectly fine most rods most common size rods six eight to seven six most people have got rods you know in that um, in that range i prefer seven seven two I like a longer rod when I'm seated in a kayak because that longer rod allows me to be able to cast farther. I get a little bit more, you know, um, uh, a lash, you know, out of a, out of a little bit of a longer rod. But I found that a 7.6 is a little bit long for me. I feel like it's a little unwieldy. It's a little too much. And typically, when you move into the 7.6 class rods, you're in something a little bit stiffer. Um, on that same uh, notion of um, trying to match the size of the gear to the size of the fish. Um, I consider myself a, a trout fisherman. That's the fish that I love to catch. Um, and if I'm looking for a, any sort of a trophy fish, I'm typically looking for trout. If, I, if, 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 I, if there's a fish that I want to catch and consider a trophy and be proud of, I hope it's going to be, you know, going to be a trout and not something else. So I use a little bit lighter tackle in that, um, in that regard. I prefer a 7 or 7.2. This is probably a 7.2. Seven 
a little bit of a longer rod other than the 6.8. It allows us as kayak anglers not only to be able to get that longer cast, but we've all experienced the fish running around the back, running around the front. That longer rod does give me a little bit of ability to, to get around, you know, the bow, the, the bow of the boat or the stern of the boat to be able to, um, to be able to work my way around. So that little bit of length, you know, does help. For me personally, 7.6 is getting a little bit, um, a little bit long. Um, I prefer um, a medium and a medium heavy for, for redfish. This is a medium and it's pretty whippy. Uh, you know, but again, I, I you know I don't want to to dwell too much on the, the the details of what you guys use versus what I use. If you've got something that you're completely comfortable with, that's perfectly fine. Just my, these are just my suggestions. This what this is what um, you know what what works for me. Um, I do think that the the, the the a rod in the seven foot range is is going to be a little bit more um, easy for a kayak angler than something that's shorter than that. Lines. Monofilament and braid. Do we have anybody that uses just monofilament or just braid? Well, let's see if I can change your minds just a little bit. Um, I think monofilament and braid has a place in everybody's, um, everybody's arsenal. And not just offshore, inshore. I think when you're redfishing, trout fishing, snook fishing, I think that you could benefit from having both of those lines um, on, your, um, uh, on your boat. We'll talk about monofilament a little bit. The way that I spool my rods, this is just the way that I do it, just to give you guys an, an idea of, of how I, um, you know, how I do it. Uh, this particular rod, the one that I brought, it's got braid on it. But if I'm fishing, if I'm spooling with monofilament, I go all the way to the spool with the same line. I don't do any backing. I don't put 40 pound and then, you know, taper it down or anything like that. Too complicated. Um, I just, I spool it all the way to the, all the way to the spool with the same line. Um, I typically use with monofilament 8, 10, and 12 pound test. Um, for inshore fishing, now again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking redfish, trout, and snook for the most part. 8, 10, and 12 pound test, um, you know, monofilament. Anything lighter than that, I feel like I'm stressing the fish, fish a little bit, and I just don't think there's any need to go any, any heavier than, than 12 pound test. Um, monofilament has stretch, absolutely has stretch. Um, I'm going to use that to my advantage. Thinking about trout and snook, for instance. These are fish that jump and they shake their head. I want that stretch. I want that, I want that little bit of a stretch. When you look at successful offshore big game fishermen, marlin fishermen, all of their reels are spool, spooled with, with monofilament. Very seldom will you see braid on a tournament billfish angler's reel because they want, they absolutely want that, that stretch. Now, a lot of guys, they'll pull double duty. They've got a jig or bottom fish and troll, whatever. And, and you know, they'll, they'll use braid. And the, and the kayak world is, is the same way. I've got a lot of buddies who use braid, you know, for all their offshore reels because they do speed jigging and troll as well. So, and there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And again, so things that I say are not the end all do all, but hopefully you'll find some truth, you know, in some of the things that, I, you know, I'm saying. Um, the drawbacks. Solar damage and age. Of course, monofilament gets old. If you leave it out in the sun, it's a it's a, um, a petroleum product. It's going to break down. I just store my reels inside. I, you know, I have probably 50 spools of monofilament in my garage at any given time. I don't put them in the refrigerator. I don't hide them in the dark. I just you know I leave them you know out of the sun for the most part. Um, one of the major drawbacks with monofilament is twist. Everybody knows we get that, that twist. If I'm going to be fishing with soft plastics, um, if I'm going to be using some sort of like a, a Berkeley Gulp, you know, jerk shad or something like that, probably not going to use the monofilament or I'm going to be very careful to let it, let it untwist because any bait that twists is going to uh, really be exaggerated with my monofilament. Um, now that's not to say that I won't. I love to use eight-pound test monofilament trout fishing with a soft plastic. I absolutely love that, but I have to take a lot of care to keep from having those twists. I've got to hold that, you know, that, that lure up in the air for a long time and let it untwist and untwist almost every cast. Um, I change mine a couple times a year. You know, I'm not like regimented every quarter, every month. If a spool starts getting low, I'll change it out. Or if I if I don't think I've changed it in six months, I'll, I'll change it. But I'm not necessarily regimented until the spool starts getting down. And typically, the spool is getting down is because when I come home from a trip. I'm stripping it, and if I feel a nick, I cu you know I cut it there. And once it gets down, you know a little bit of a ways, then I'll then I'll go ahead and change it out. Braid. Um, I do the same thing with my braid. It is more expensive, but I'll give you a little tip. I um, I wrap three or four wraps of electrical tape around my spools. 
uh, it's kind of squishy, so it, it, the the braid doesn't slip on the spool. Uh, a lot of spool, a lot of the manufacturers now they're putting like a rubber gasket or something around there to do the same thing, but it also keeps me from having to fill the whole spool up as well. If I put a few wraps of electrical tape around there, you know, it makes it a little bit thicker, so I don't have to put quite as much um, braid on there. Um, I, I I get the 300 yard spools, and on a 4,000 reel, that's you know it it'll hold you know. That, 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 that's perfect. I, you know, I'm throwing, I'm throwing part of the, the, uh, the spool away. Um, again, a pro, a, approximate size, um, 8 pound, 10 pound, and 20 pound. And the 20 pound is typically going to be something that I'm using for big redfish or big snook. And I'm using that braid because I'm fishing around oysters or around the mangroves or something like that. That's the heaviest line that I'll use is a 20 pound braid. I think this is probably 10 pound Power Pro, you know, that's on here. The benefits of the braid no, no stretch with a redfish, absolutely perfect. Um, I can cast it a mile because the stuff is like, you know, it's like thread. It's, so, it's such a small diameter. I can cast it a, lo a long way. So that's a, that's a fantastic advantage. Um, some of the drawbacks, again, solar damage and age. Um, this particular uh, model of Power Pro is brown. It turns a light tan color as it starts to get old. Everybody's familiar with the green Power Pro. And, it, and, it's, and it, when you hold a new spool up against an old spool, you can see that it really changes color. That's actually the coating that's on, that's on top of it. Most of these um, braids are actually sort of a white color, and they dye them. Um, once it starts get, you know, getting that light color, it's starting to get a little bit old. It's been in the sun a pretty good, pretty good time. When it gets fuzzy or badly discolored, and you know what I mean, you can actually kind of see the fuzz on it. It's got some wear on it. That's when I'm probably going to change. When, when I'm probably going to change it out. Um, we call them all wind knots, wind knots, but it's actually two different types of knot. A wind knot is the kind of knot that comes on the on the tip of the rod where it's a pain in the neck and you have to pull it off. The ones that happen on your spool, the ones that I call lassoes, the little small knot that's on here, that's actually a uh, a spool knot. Two different things that, that cause that. The wind knots are typically called by, caused by the wind. You've got braid is so so limp, it's just all over the place, and you move your rod a little bit. If there's any kind of wind or anything, then it gets wrapped around the tip. The spool knots are caused as you retrieve. Let's think about a um, a topwater lure. You're bringing in a Zara spook. You've got a little bit of slack in order to make the thing walk the dog. You have to have a little bit of slack in the line. Well, that slack translate in, translate into a little bit of slack on the spool as well. So if you grab the spool, the loops are not quite as tight. You can actually kind of see the, some, of the, some of the loops actually moving a little bit. Well, what happens is when you go to cast the next time, there's a lot of pressure on that. It grabs those loose coils, and it pulls them off because they're loose. So it pulls them off, and now you've got this nasty mess you know, right here that you've got to go through. Is there any way to solve that? Not really. Other than, you know, if you're going to pinch the line con constantly while you're pulling it in, but, you know, that's too much of a pain in the neck while you're, um, you know, while you're trying to work a lure. I can give you a little tip that'll help. The um, electrical tape trick. If you'll take the electrical tape and you'll actually wrap it in a manner so that it's, it makes your spool shaped from the bottom to the top. So it's actually more wraps on the top than the bottom, if that makes sense. Let's say one wrap of tape at the bottom of the spool, three wraps of tape at the top, so that when you spool that reel, it actually, the, the line on there looks like a V. It looks, it looks like this. Now what that does is as you're reeling it in, it's still going to put the line, you know, the spool is going to move up and down, up and down. It's going to put the line on the back in smaller coils and the line on the front in larger coils. So when you go to cast, those smaller coils in the back, they can't come off because they're smaller than the larger coils in the front. So they're actually holding themselves on there. Um, this spool looks pretty straight. Um, some, sometimes when I spool it, it's a very distinct, you know, V. It almost looks like, man, you messed up when you spool this thing. It's, you know, it's, it's cockeyed. It's crooked. You know, you got more line at the top than you do at the bottom, but I've actually done that, you know, on, on purpose because it keeps those tight, uh, those tight coils um, on the bottom. Here's another fantastic trick. The reason that I, that I spool all the way to the spool is I'll cut this line off. I've got another, another reel, and I rotate them back and forth. I'll change one from mono to braid and braid to mono. I strip all the mono off because that mono is, is not any good anymore. I'll take and I'll wrap about 10 or 12 wraps of electrical tape, and I'll make it really fat. And I'll tie this line onto that spool, and I'll reel it in so I'm actually using the portion of line the, of braid that was 
at the base, now it's the tip. So I can actually kind of get double, you know, double use, you know, out of that. Now I've lost some line capacity, obviously, but how many people have had a trout take out 250 yards of line? Yeah, not, not yeah. usually. So yeah, that's, that's a nice way. If you're going to spend $25 on a spool of braid, you can actually get double duty out of it by, you know, by doing it that way. So. No problem with memory and all. But with monofilament? Well, not with, with uh, braid, right? Braid has no, n has no yeah, memory yeah. whatsoever. It's like thread. Okay. Yeah, you know, that's one of the problems with it, and that's why you get those funny coils is because it doesn't have any, um, any memory. Um, with monofilaments, I strongly recommend a good quality monofilament, whether it's a um, uh, Trilene or Strand or Big Game or whatever, whatever brand. I use Andy. I've used Andy all my, all my life, so it's the one that I, you know, that I prefer, and it's actually still one of the cheapest you know, monofilaments. It's, um, it's not necessarily tiny in diameter compared to some of some of the others but uh, you know it it, it has it has great uh, abrasion resistance and a spool of it I can buy you know uh, five spools of Andy for the cost of some of the you know Seaguar you know that kind of stuff so which are which are all fantastic lines I just you know I, I, I get because I change my line so often I've got so many reels I get a lot of bang for the buck out of the um, out of the Andy so okay fluorocarbon fluorocarbon I'm going to use as a leader material um, most of the time, 100% fluorocarbon. Now, there's some manufacturers, uh, Seaguar and Trilene, that are making fluorocarbon line that you just spool to. You know, it's got 300 yards on there, and you spool it all the way to, um, you know, to the spool on your reel. It's not 100% fluorocarbon. Even if it says 100% fluorocarbon, it has 100% fluorocarbon in it. That's like ham that's like uh, McDonald's saying it's 100% Angus beef. Yeah, but what parts of the Angus beef, you know, is it? It's eyeballs and you know lips, but. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, um, so 100% fluorocarbon, it's extraordinarily expensive. You buy a skein, one of the little small spools is $25, $30, $50, dollars, you know, on, on that stuff. It's expensive, so we want to use it, um, you know, sparingly. I use it for, um, uh, for my leader material. Why do I use it for my leader material? This stuff is invisible. It's absolutely, it's like a, it's like a strand of glass. It's, it's almost completely invisible underwater, and, you know, we could Google the, optical you know uh, refraction or whatever you know that, but, it, but basically it's 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 um it's nearly invisible underwater um the abrasion resistance again it's very very stiff it's very very hard um it's like a it's like a, a strand of glass so it has great abrasion resistance it has no stretch which is you know it, it, it's helpful it's also stiff stiff is a good thing in leader um, if I was if I was using it as as line, it would be terrible because if it's stiff on the spool, it's going to want to jump off the spool and straighten itself out. But as a leader material, I want it to be stiff and straight. I don't want coils coming through the water. I want something nice, you know, nice and straight. Um, the drawbacks, again, it is expensive. Um, and as I've got in the image up there, which is fiber optics, if you nick or scratch or scrape, you draw drag it across a piling of the barnacles. Um, it's going to have little nicks in it, and it acts just like fiber optic cable. Everywhere that, that the outer skin is broken, it's going to sparkle, just like a fiber optic cable would, would sparkle. So once you get a few nicks and scratches and things in it, it's time to you know, trim it back, cut it, change it, you know, that sort of a thing. So just like you would with any, any leader, you need to feel it. If you've got some nicks and scratches and things, of course the leader is a little bit weaker, but also it's a little bit more visible to, you know, to fish coming through the water. Again, it's one of those. 10% tricks that may that may make a difference. Um, you don't want to cut your um, your fluorocarbon and keep using the same leader all day. Perfectly fine. But the guy next to you, if he keeps trimming his back, he may catch a few few more fish than you, and that might be you know one of those one of those reasons. Okay, where's my braid guys? You're one of my braid guys, right? We're gonna do a little braid braid demonstration. Okay, this is braided line, right? Hold it just between your fingers. And not necessarily, not necessarily stiff. Just think about your fish, your, your fish lips. You're a, you're a fish on the end of my line, and if I give it a little bit of a snatch, there's no stretch. It comes right out. Now I've got, I've got my nice stretchy monofilament, right? Okay. There's my monofilament. You hold it, you hold it at about the same at about the same stiffness, and now I'm a trout and I shake my head. It's a lot more difficult for for me to be able to pull it out of uh, pull it out of your mouth. So, I, I, it's obviously an exaggeration. Monofilament's not quite as stretchy as that, but it's absolutely the science behind why the stretch makes makes a difference. A fish that shakes his head, or a fish that's going to run really fast, or he's going to do any kind of jumps, tarpon, snook, trout, marlin, mahi, those types of things. If I've got that little bit of extra bungee in there, it may make a difference. It may help that fish keep stay buttoned on where um, you know where before I might have lost that fish. Okay, drag. 
it's kind of um, uh, 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 a little bit frightening to take that spool off the front and to see what all, you know, how everything's stacked in there, but it absolutely can make a difference. Not necessarily whether your drag is going to fail or not fail, but how many times have you guys seen somebody with a fish on and you hear that drag going or you watch a television show and that drag is going and you just know something terrible, you know, is about to happen. It's not that difficult to take that drag apart and keep it clean. My, my, um, my cell phone is my memory. I take pictures of everything because I can't remember. I take something apart underneath the sink. I have no idea how it went back together. I take pictures of everything. Take a reel apart. Take pictures of it one step at a time. Lay everything out. As far as your drag, really the only thing that you need to do, rinse it with fresh water and wipe it off. And you'll find out it's almost like um, uh, pencil lead you know, the material, because it's sitting there, you know, most of these things are actually made out of graphite and they're rubbing and rubbing and rubbing. And when they start to rub grooves, like your brakes, uh, you know, a car or anything like that, that's when they become a little bit jerky and things don't work the way they should. Just, you know, wipe the stuff off maybe once a year. You know, that's really all that it takes. Um, I highly recommend actually kill all the birds with one stone. Take a reel and have it, have it serviced. Um, if you own a Shimano reel, you can send it to Shimano and they do it for like 15 bucks. Um, I know there was some dis discussion on social media not too long ago about some different places that do um, uh, real servicing and things like that. If you've got a real, you know, those Shimanos are 250 bucks. Man, it's worth 20, 25 dollars once a year to have the thing serviced because they may find a problem that you didn't know existed and they're able to fix it before you've got a pile of junk instead of, you know, something that's going to last you for years and years and years. So, okay, this is a rule. This is a commandment. This is a law. When it comes to drag, people talk about, oh, I got my drag set at this many pounds or this or that. Drag is absolutely a product of the size of the hook that you're using and the tissue that you're going to have, have it hooked into. I can take a gigantic steel hook and tie it with a thread and still be able to pull it. Or I can take a gigantic piece of rope and put the tiniest hook on it and still be able to pull whatever it is that I want to pull as well. It just, it just matters how hard I'm going to pull, how much strength I'm going to use to, to pull it. It has to do with the size of the hook and what it's stuck in. If I've got a hook that's going to be stuck in a redfish's hard mouth, I can, put, I can clamp down a little bit of drag, but if I've got it stuck in that tiny little membrane, a little tiny hook stuck in that little tiny membrane in a trout's mouth, I don't want my drag set quite as, quite as strong. So when I set the drag on any of my reels, it's not like, oh, I'm using this bait or I'm fishing for this fish. It's the size of the hook and then, then what it's going to be stuck in, typically if it's, um, if it's a, um, you know, a trout or a redfish or, or something like that. And this is one of my favorite, favorite statements, and offshore guys are this way, especially the guys that jig or, you know, fish for offshore fish. Oh, I use braid, man. I just clamp it down. I, I just clamp it down. And I think to myself, how many fish have you lost, you know, reeling in? You know, they get halfway to the boat, and all of a sudden they just come unhooked. They didn't just come unhooked. You have worked that hook out of their mouth by applying too much, too much drag. It's the same thing with the little experiment, you know, that we did. You jerk, 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 jerk enough times. You give something enough pressure. It's going to, it's going to make a, the hook is going to make a bigger hole. It's going to work its way out or you're absolutely good. If you had, if, if, if the devil himself put a hook in you and a rope, you would do everything you could to get away. You would rip your flesh to get away. Fish is no different. He's going to do everything that he can to, to get away. If you give him 20 pounds of drag, he's going to rip his mouth, his skin, whatever, and get away. I don't want to do that. I want to give him just enough line that I can wear him out and finally get him, get him back to me. I've caught some huge kingfish on number six hooks. That is about two sizes smaller than what's in a Miradine. Miradine, Miradine has got a number two or a number, uh, number four hook in it. I've caught some really big fish on some really, really tiny hooks. It absolutely can be done with the proper drag settings. The point I'm trying to get across is lighten your drag. Don't tighten your drag. Keep your drag as light as you possibly, as, 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 as you possibly can. And keep in mind, you catch a, a you hook a 30 a 30 inch redfish on on 10 pound test. He's going to take out a pretty good bit of line. He's going to be going through some grass, some weeds, you know, all that kind of stuff. You're going to have that bow in your line. You're adding drag to that line. You're adding physical drag because the weight of the water, the weight of any weeds or anything like that. This is a great time to back off on the drag, not tighten the drag down because more drag has already been added without you being involved. Um, we're talking about the stretch. Now, even if I am using braid, if I've got that, that, that great big loop, you know, that's in the water, if a fish goes to take off, he's that not actually stretching the braid, but he's bringing that loop 
out of you know out of um, uh, you know out of the connection between the two of us. Instead of being a nice straight connection, there's a there's a loop there's a nice loop connection that actually adds uh, to our benefit if we're fishing with braid and we've got a loop in the line that gives us that, that little bit of you know emergency bungee you know sort of a thing there. Um, your rod angle can affect the, your drag as well. Uh, you guys have heard, especially it's, it's a fly fishing term they're called high sticking, where you've got your rod, you know, too high in, in the air. It absolutely, and we, and we could we could do do it with an experiment. If you have your rod set at about a 45 degree angle, that's about where that rod is loaded up and it's ready to do do its thing. If you lower the lower the rod, you're reducing the tension on the uh, on on the line from the rod itself. The drag can be pulled out a lot more easily. If you raise the rod up, you're actually adding uh, drag to it. But now you're actually uh, putting the rod in, an, in a position that it doesn't want to be in. You've overloaded the rod at that point. If you can at all help it, keep your rod at a 45 degree angle. If a fish wants to run, I don't want to stop them. I want to let them. I'll bow. I'll, 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 I will absolutely let that fish take more line. You know, I, and as the fish gets closer to the boat, if I need to add a little bit of drag, I can raise the rod a little bit. And if he wants to go, I'm going to absolutely bow. I'm going to let him go. But by just by dropping the rod, I'm, I'm reducing tension and letting that fish take off. Yes, sir? I mean, I grew up fishing a little bit, and I thought in my head, if I got, it, got him in quicker, then I, I got him in. And we, we have to think, we have, well, so the, there, there, is, there is a delicate balance there between if I let him, you know, stay on the hook long enough, he's eventually going to wear, the, you know, the hook's going to wear a hole, you know, and fall out. So we do sort of have that delicate balance there. But, um, you know, that, that's something that we really, that's one of those things that I can't account for. That I'm not, I, you know, if, if that hook is going to wear a hole and it's going to fall out of his mouth, I can't, you know, I can't, um, I can't control that. But I can control the fact that if that drag is, is too tight, I stand a much greater possibility of tearing the hook out of that out of that fish's mouth. Or if he goes to shake his head, he can increase the size of that hole, you know, because I haven't given him any, um, you know, any, um, uh, uh, any of that bounce, you know, to be able to just absorb the bounce rather than the hole being torn, uh, torn easier. Um, it's a tug of war, and this is something that it's hard for me to teach kids. Sometimes, uh, you know, on the boat or in the kayaks is he's not going anywhere. You don't have to bite your lip and crank it in. Fish is not going anywhere. Unless we're fishing around stumps, and I typically don't do that in salt water. That's usually bass fishing. He's not going anywhere. It's a tug of war. We're going to go nice and easy, and we're going to wear him out. We're going to see who gets tired first. And eventually, and you could bring a porpoise, you know, to the boat with eight-pound test monofilament. Once it's tired, you know, it's just, you know, it's just a little bit of, uh, of uh, you know, tug to, to get him there. So um, I'll fight a fish a lot longer than, you know, than, uh, um, you know, I don't want to necessarily say longer than, than, than need be, but I would rather fish, fight a fish longer than try to drag him, you know, drag him into the boat. Um, because I worry about, you know, I worry about the drag. Now, that's not to say I'm going to let a fish run and run and run and run and exhaust them, you know, completely beyond... Um, you know the, their ability to um, uh, their their ability to revive themselves, but there is you know there kind of is that balance. It's, it, it's it's a valid it's a valid point, but I'm going to depend on my equipment and my gear and everything to work properly. And I I consider it. Think about that tiny little hook that's in their mouth and that tiny little piece of thread. And I'm going to give more than I'm going to than I'm going to pull than I'm going to pull back. If that makes sense. So. Well, it may it may make it may make a difference in getting those you know those fish to the boat, especially when you get a big fish. When you you know when you when you hook a really large fish and you're trying to really you know muscle that fish, and he is strong enough to be able to pull drag, or he is strong enough to be able to shake that hook loose, you may land that fish now. As whereas if you're trying to, you know, to muscle the fish to the boat, he was able to you know to get away. Um, yeah, you, we catch a one pound trout, we can almost just skeet him across the top of the water, you know, to get him to us. But when we get into a larger fish, something that's really matched to our tackle, then you know it can certainly make uh, make that difference. Um, Learn to bow. I think it's um, you know I think that's incredible, and you are my poster child for how many times have you heard I lost him right at the boat? Well, if you've got everything clamped down and you drag him you know to the boat and it's like oh he's right there I'm fixing to reach and grab him and he goes and he's gone because we've we've allowed him to have no drag we've allowed him to increase the size of the hole in his mouth from the hook and he's still green he's still ready to fight and he can really take off you know that's that's typically when, the, when people say man most fish are lost right at the boat well that's one of those reasons you brought the fish to the boat a little bit green you put a little bit too much you know stress on the line the tackle the hook you made a big you know hole in the mouth you know that sort of a thing so knots uh, i've got four knots listed there uni knot a loop knot an albright or an improved albright and i hate to say this for some reason a guy named alberto has decided that's his knot yeah, no. the crazy alberto it's an Albright, yes. It's going around the internet now that that's a crazy Alberto knot. But, um, and this, the FG knot is a brand new knot. 
Um, I'm going to go through each one of these. These are the only knots that I tie. These, these are it. If you got a trilene knot or your grandfather's knot or a double whammy granny knot, any knot that you, that you like, don't stop using it. It's fantastic. With modern monofilaments and with modern braids, lines are really, really strong. Knots are really, really strong. Unless you purposely tie something in a, in a complete mess, if you've got a knot that, you, that you're comfortable with, stay with that knot. There's no, there's no reason to change. Let me tell you about these knots, some of the drawbacks and some of the pluses, and you may want to research and try, and try something a little bit different. The uni knot. Uni knot, uh, I've, I've used this, God, since I was a kid. It's probably one of the first knots that I, that I learned to tie. Um, it's a tight line knot, which is important because it cinches down to, uh, if I'm fishing with a lure, uh, if it cinches down to the lure, there's no loop or, or, you know, or anything, anything like that. Um, we also use it for line-to-line -line connections, so if you're using um, fluorocarbon as a leader or you're using monofilament as a leader, a lot of guys will use, um, you know, they're using their 20-pound braid and then they tie on a 20-pound fluorocarbon leader or monofilament leader. That's the connection they use to put those two together. So it's a real, it's a real common knot. Um, I use this on topwater lures. This is specific, specific for my topwater lures because when I'm using a topwater lure as opposed to a soft plastic or as opposed to, some, you know, some other type of a search bait, I want to control what that lure is doing. If I'm pulling a chug bug or if I'm throwing, you know, a top dog or something like that, I need to control where that, what that bait is doing. Um, being able to walk, that, walk the dog, I don't want the bait to just be able to run wherever. I want to be able to control it. So therefore, I do not want a loop knot. I want the knot to be tight against the, um, against the loop. Um, I use this for all live bait and, um, and most absolutely certainly for, um, for circle hooks. Now, I purposely tied on here a terrible fluorocarbon leader that's just got nicks and all sort of terrible stuff in it. I've got a circle hook, and I tied it on with a loop knot, which we are going to talk about in just, in just a minute. Uh, some guys love loop knots because they say, oh, man, it really get, you know, it lets that thing just you know, jangle all, you know, all over the place. With a circle hook for our live bait fishermen, and I live bait fish as well. I use you know, live mullet in Menhaden. I'll use cut bait. I'm not you know, above using, using that kind of, th kind of a thing. Um, I love to use a circle hook. The whole reason that the circle hook works is because it's one stiff, straight connection. We want to be able to control where the hook goes. So when it gets into the corner of the fish's mouth, if it's nice and straight, the fish bites it in this direction and as he swims off, it catches in the corner of the mouth. It, the circle hook only works when the fish is going the other direction. If the fish is swimming at me, the whole principle of the circle, I can just pull the hook straight out of the fish's mouth. It only works when he's, when he's swimming away from me, it catches in the corner of his mouth. But if I have a loop knot tied in it, I don't have that straight connection anymore. There's no telling which way that hook is going to rotate now. It may rotate in a, ma in a manner that the hook slides itself, that slides itself out. So with any kind of live bait fishing, whether you use a, a, a O'Shaughnessy or a bait keeper or whatever, or you use a circle hook, I use a uni knot, use that nice, nice stiff connection rather than the loop knot. If you guys want to take a chance at some point if we have, when we have an intermission or later, um, I've, got a, I've got a pretty good loop knot tied on here so you'll be able to see it nice and close. I've left the tag in on here. We're going to talk about the loop knot in a few minutes and you'll understand why the tag in the way it is and you'll be able to feel those nicks and stuff. This is one that I would absolutely, you know, absolutely cut off. Um, one of the drawbacks for the, um, the uni knot for line-to-line -line connections, when you tie a uni knot, the tag ends, they oppose each other. It sticks, it sticks straight out. Well, it does two things in my line-to-line -line connection. It catches click, 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 click. Every time I pull it through my guides, click, 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 click. Even if I cut it off just as close as I possibly can, it's adding some friction. If I have a leader that's long enough that I have to reel up into the tip, Every time I cast it, it's add, adding a little bit of friction. My accuracy is going to be off. My distance is going to be off, you know, 10%. You know, every one of these things, if it's a tenth of a percent that, you know, that adds to your fishing day, add them up, you know, and, and it can make a difference. Also, hangs up in the grass. Um, you know, these things oppose each other. And if I'm working a, a, a lure, come, you know, coming through there, if it catches one little piece of grass coming through the water, well, a fish is accustomed to looking at tiny little things. And if he sees this funky little piece of grass going through the water, he's like, what is, I'm, I don't want, I'm not eating that. Is that? So, it also has a relatively large, um, a large profile. It's a pretty big knot. It's not a tiny knot. When you look at it, you think, oh, that's a tiny knot, knot especially a guy with bad vision like me. Like, that's, that's a tiny little knot. Compared to some other knots, it's actually a pretty, a pretty big knot. Um, if you're not familiar with the, with the uni knot, this is a basic um, directions. You can Google it and, uh, and learn how to tie it. It's a really simple knot to tie. It's almost 100% line strength. You know, it's a, fantastic, it's a fantastic knot. But as I said, it's got a really big profile. 
and the tag end sticks straight out. So it's going to catch just about anything, you know, no matter how closely you, um, you clip it. Okay, this is the loop knot that I was talking about um, earlier. Um, this is when I attach um, a lure that I want to allow free movement. I want this lure to have a little bit of freedom to be able to do crazy, weird, uh, weird, thing, weird things. Um, jerk baits, soft plastics, jig heads. Um, most, of my, most of my lures, other than the top waters, because I want that sort of erratic action, I want them to be able to jump around and do that, you know, do that sort of a thing. So I'll use a loop knot at that point. It has a tiny little profile. It's a tiny little knot. It's basically an overhand knot with a loop in it. It's a tiny little thing. The tag end faces straight down. Rather than facing out or facing up, the tag end faces straight down. So it's almost weedless. It's a fantastic little knot. And you can trim it back um, really, really close. Um, it does have to be tied correctly. It's not a hard knot to tie. It takes a little bit of practice, and you've got to use your reading glasses like me to be able to make sure you've got it in the, in the right place. And as far as the knot strength, I'm not sure it's 100%. You know, it's one of those ones that always fails when they do the knot test, but something else is going to fail long before my knots do. I don't necessarily, if my knot failed, then I probably have my drag too tight, first of all. That's the first thing I'm going to say. Somebody says, oh, man, my knot failed. I'm like, what's your drag set at? Check your drag. You know, that's the first thing because, you know, I've got 10-pound 10 10 pound braid on there. My drag is probably set at one pound. You know, it's really, really, really light. So um, here's a good, pretty good picture of it. It looks um, sort of intimidating to, um, to tie, but basically it's an overhand knot that loops around and goes back through. It's, it's really simple. And again, you can Google it, and um, there's some websites that actually have the little animations that will show you how to, how, to, how to tie them. We could sit here all night and practice, but that's a, you know, that's a waste of your guys' time. But if you will notice in the picture, you see that tag in facing down. So any, any um, uh, weeds or anything like that is going to slide right over the top. It's not going to you know, hook onto it as well. Okay, the Albright. The Albright Special and the Improved Albright, or the Crazy Alberto Knot. This is something that's used for line-to-line -line connections as well. It's used specifically for line-to-line -line connections. Um, I think it was invented by the fly anglers again. This is how they would tie their leader onto the fly line, that sort of a thing. It's a really strong knot. It has a relatively small um, uh, profile. Um, we use it um, for braid to fluorocarbon for the most part. That's what, you know, what it's typically um, used for. It has to be tied properly or it'll slip. Modern braids, and we talked about the color. It's that, you know, a Power Pro is that green color. It has that slick, and there's actually one of the Power Pros is actually called Super Slick. It has some sort of a coating on it, not slip, you know, really easily. So basically what I tell people, if you're tying a knot with braid, if it says do five wraps, do eight. Do 50% more than you know than, than you need to. With the Albright, it's the same. It's the same way. Um, I just do more wraps, you know, with it. Um, this one also does have an opposing um, opposing tag in. Here's a little bit of a drawing of it. Um, this is going to be your line. This is going to be your leader because it's typically thicker. You're going to have a tag in here, and you're going to have a tag in here. Um, it, it, most, um, most of the um, websites are going to tell you to do seven or eight wraps down. To make it improved, you do seven or eight wraps back up, and then it comes out the same way that it, that it went in. What I actually do is I go back around one more time. I just slip it right back through, and I don't have any problems with it, with it slipping. You pull everything tight. It's a fairly small knot. You're going to have a little bit of a tag in here, and you're going to have a little bit of a tag in here. But this is going to your lure, so this tag in doesn't catch grass. This will be the one that catches grass. And if this is your um, your, bra uh, your braid, then it's it, you know it's not stiff. You know it, it's 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 kind of limp. You know so anyway. Take the tag into the braid and loop it around one more time. Yep. See uh, where, where it's come out. Where it's come out here. I'll just go right back in. And it'll oh, still okay. tighten up. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure will. Yeah. Because basically you're, you're holding you're holding this, and all this is sliding up, yeah. and you can use this to. It, to pull it, with, yeah. Yep. No, you don't do it like, do it and then tighten it up and then just lock it one more time with that last loop that you're talking about. Is that like a final? No, no. I, I, I'll go through. I do my wraps down. I do my wraps up. I'll go through. Then I go back through again. I hold everything here and then I kind of slide everything up and then I pull it all tight. And basically with this particular one, that, that's a good tip. I hold all four pieces at one time, you know, when, yeah. when I tighten and that, and that pulls everything, everything tight. Okay, but 
forget all that. You don't want to know anything about an Albright anymore because now we have the FG knot. This, <laughs> this, this is, I think aliens invented this knot and gave it, gave it to us. Who, whoever invented Velcro and the microwave oven came up with the FG knot. This thing is absolutely fantastic. Um, I've been using it all year and I, I'm a skeptic when it comes to, you know, new stuff like this. But um, I'm using it. There's an FG knot on that, um, on that rod there so you can get an idea. And that's not necessarily a, a, a laboratory, you know, knot, but that's, that's a real world knot that's on there. Um, I've used it with mono to mono. I've used it with mono to fluorocarbon. I use it with all of my braid to, um, to fluorocarbon. It's, it's extraordinarily tiny. Um, and it has almost no tag in uh, whatsoever. And again, the tag in is basically the, um, uh, the braid. So you can trim it really close. And because it's, you know, floppy, it doesn't catch grass, you know, or anything like that. I haven't found a drawback yet. I, I don't, I don't know if there's anything wrong with this knot. But the only thing that, that it's used for is line-to-line -line, um, connections. It is, a, it is not necessarily complicated to tie, but to give the instructions is incre incredibly complicated to tie. There's a couple of um, um, YouTube videos and things like that, and that's actually where I, where I learned how to tie the thing. Um, and I do it exactly like they say on the, um, on the videos. Um, it's a difficult knot to tie in the kayak, and because I'm using it for my line-to-leader knot, I just make my leader a little bit longer than I used to. That way I don't have to tie another one in the boat. And because it is so tiny, it goes through the guides really easily so I don't have to um, make a short, a short leader, you know, so that the... the so how long will you make that leader then? This one I'll do, I'll do 24, 30 inches. Nice. My typical leaders are 18 inches or so, something, you know, something like that, so. Mm -hmm. And it goes through, the, goes through the guides fine. Well, you see how tiny it is. Wow. It is absolutely, uh, you know, it, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing to it. This would be your fluorocarbon leader. There is no knot in the fluorocarbon. It's straight, so it doesn't bend, it doesn't twist, it doesn't loop around. There is no tag-in. The tag-in is hidden right here. Basically, it works like a Chinese finger trap. You're making a Chinese finger trap over the, um, uh, over the fluorocarbon. The only tag-in is, um, uh, is your braid, and it would be, uh, it'll be on this end, and you can tag it, uh, tie it off to almost absolutely um, you know, uh, zero. But you can actually see the little weaves you know, in there. It looks like a Chinese finger, finger trap. So fantastic uh, uh, knot. I'm just, I, I wish I would have invented it. Um, we've been going for an hour. You guys want to get up, take, your, take a break? Stre it anything, or it's just the, the That's a secret I don't like to tell people, but I keep a tube of super glue in my kayak at all times. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'll put a, this particular knot, I'll put a little drop of super, super glue on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I use a super glue too to keep my soft plastics on a jig head or on a hook or something like that. That's one of the bass guys, you know, tricks I picked up from the bass guys. I'm like, man, I, why don't the saltwater guys do that? And yeah, it, it works. So, like I say, we've been going for an hour. You guys want to stretch your legs? Or you want to keep going? Uh, it's, it's up to you. So. Any other questions or anything? Want to just? Uh, Actually, I yes, sir. Have one, um, blue, red, seagull. Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Um, the not, it, red, red is the uh, is the first color in the spectrum that disappears. You know, at 20 feet or, or you know or whatever. That's what the guys say. I use red hooks because it disappears, or red line because it disappears. Listen, why did God make a red snapper red? You know, he lives in 100 feet of water. So if you're telling me that fish can't see red, then why is a red snapper red? Why is a red grouper red? Why is a red coral red? I don't think red disappears to a fish. It does to us. Um, I think that fish, just my personal opinion, I don't necessarily think a fish can tell the difference between teal and cyan or, you know, this shade or that shade, but they actually absolutely can tell the difference between black, white, red, you know, the ba basically the, uh, you know, the basic, uh, the basic colors. My grandfather used red and white lures his entire life and he caught fish hand over, hand over fist. So, you know, uh, you know, fish, fish can see total distinct colors, but different variations and shades and, you know, and that sort of thing. So the red line, I, I don't buy into the red line, you know, uh, uh, disappears. So I wouldn't pay any more money for red line than I would for, you know, for another color. I would prefer my, my lines to be invisible if at all possible. So if they could make clear uh, braid, that's what I would use. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. The pretty simple ones, because back to where you were talking about the different knots you tie. Mm -hmm. I've always tied that small exact same loop knot for my top water plugs. I like I like a, a stiff connection with my topwater lure because I feel like as I'm giving it that tug, I want it to pull the direction that I want it to pull. If it's got a loop, the lure may be sitting in one direction and the line may have adjusted to another direction. Another reason I use 
fluorocarbon because it's a stiff connection and I can guide it like I would you know I think about walking a dog if I've got a dog on a leash he can kind of go where he wants to go but if I have him on a, st a, st a straight you know a, a, yeah yeah then he can't he can't you know pull around you know quite as much so specifically for the top waters if it's pointing to the left you know I give it a tug I know it's going to go to the left other than the line loop you know being in another you know another direction I hope that makes sense yeah Yes, sir. Do you have to use a swivel between the, uh, like a model and coral? I don't use a swivel, and that's why we use the knots like the FG um, or the Uni to Uni or the Albright. Those are basically line to line connections. I'm trying to get the swivel out of there. Um, to a trout, that may look like a tiny little glass minnow coming through the water or something. It doesn't look quite right, something, you know, something different. And on top of that, it actually has a little bit of a weight. So it's affecting the way that my line, you know, travels. Again, I want to be able to um, put the action in my lure and not having anything else um, affect it. Now, that's not to say that I don't use swivels. Offshore, you know, there are other situations as well. But here, specifically thinking about um, the type of fishing that we're doing in the lagoon or, you know, or Tampa or, you know, somewhere like that, I'm not typically using a swivel. Um, I understand it's easy. It's easier. Um, it's an easier connection if you're not... Um, proficient with tying those line line to line knots um, but again that may be that 10 percent you know effect sort of a thing so if at all possible i would learn to tie the albright's a fairly easy one uh, um it does have you know the tag ends but the albright's a fairly easy knot to tie that'd be one that i would practice but um if you guys can all learn that uh, that fg knot i think you guys will be really um, you know really impressed with it and as i say i've got one tied on on here it's a little dirty and grungy but i mean you almost can't even see where one one ends and the other begins, especially as old guys who can't see you know, yeah. anything. But it has a tiny, it ha, it, it's, it's sort of a long knot because of the Chinese finger puzzle, but it doesn't have a lot of profile. It's, it's, you know, it's not fat. So the difference between the two is, uh, you know, it's just, it's tiny. So, and it slides through the guides, you know, so, so well. It's, it's absolutely a great knot. So. Nobody needs a pee break or anything? Uh, okay. I think difficult, to, that's almost impossible to try in the kayak though, isn't it? Well, the way that I tie it, I actually have to hold Part of it between my toes and i have to have yeah. a little bit of tension here and over and over so it is it's it's kind of like um yoga or with um with the i've been practicing on what to put the tension on and where where to put the tension and it's actually what i found and it's it's actually it's actually pretty amazing um i'll put the rod tip away from me and i'll hold the rod in between my legs and i put the the line in my mouth and my le my leader spool. That's and, and I actually have a loop a loop here, and the leader spool is just adding just enough tension, and I'm over and over and over and over and over and over, and you get everything you know you get everything tight, and then it's just a couple of the half inches, and that's it. You know, pull everything tight. So it's a wasteful knot because you end up using more. You have a longer tag in on my expensive you know fluorocarbon. You have to cut you know more of that off, but um, but the results are just you know fantastic. So the FG is wasteful. This is a wasteful knot because it ends up, you end up with a long tag in. Oh, and fluorocarbon is so expensive, man, I yeah. want the tiniest little tag ends I can get. Because I'm cheap, man, I'm cheap. <laughs> so, okay, we're going to keep going? Yeah. Okay. Do you need a break? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm a fire hydrant, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, electronics. So Who's got electronics in their kayak now? Uh, it's a pretty small, per small percentage. Not a lot of people have the electronics in their boat. Is it a nicety or is it a necessity? People ask me about that. Oh, man, I got a kayak because I want it to be inexpensive and I just want to make it easy. I don't want to be overly complicated. Absolutely perfect. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. But when people say, look, I'm thinking about getting it. What do you, what do you think? What do you really think? And I say, you have an app system in your car 10 years ago. Would you have had one? But now you can't live without it. Once you have a tool like that, it's hard, it's hard to go back. My opinion, absolutely. And I've got I've got uses um, for those electronics that uh, I I could not fish in some areas and, and in some techniques without my without my electronics. Um, we still have two different options. We've got uh, Fish Finder only, and then we have Fish Finder and GPS. Um, they still make um, and, and and I'm going to use the word inexpensive inexpensive units that are uh, Fish Finder only, black and white, very simple units. Fantastic. It gets you. You know what you uh, the information that you need as far as using a gps well can i get a fish finder not the gps absolutely the gps allows me to do a handful of things where i fish in fort pierce i've got rocks and pilings that are submerged that i know a snook is hiding behind them i can go today and i can drop a bait right there and, and be able to catch that snook wouldn't be able to find him if i didn't have that gps i use my G i have thousands of waypoints uh, in my bass fishing 
um, as I'm going down a bank, I'll hit, I'll hit the, um, the waypoint button every time I catch a fish. And then, then the next time I, I visit that place or the next tournament, I know the areas where I caught those fish, whether it's submerged structure or whether it's a shoreline that I just don't remember. Um, if I find a, a dip or a valley somewhere, um, I can hit that GPS and save that waypoint and be able to, uh, to get back to it, even on a flat. I can find places on a flat that maybe other guys, you know, don't, you know, don't fish that frequently. I love it when people say, I got a secret spot or I got a spot or I discovered or I found. Come on, are you kidding me? You think nobody's found that before? You know, <laughs> no, there are no secrets, man. Come on, you know, it's, just, it's like a nudist colony. We all know what everybody's got, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be able to get back to those spots. So GPS helps me, you know, helps me do that. And today's modern GPS is even if it's in a kayak, man, I, I can find a, a trash can, you know, lid, you know, on a flat. You know, the modern GPS is just absolutely fantastic. Talk about transducers. Um, I'm a Hobie guy, so we've got the little pocket to be able to put our, um, our transducer in, which is fantastic. There's a lot of manufacturers that make, um, you know, over the side mounts or, uh, you know, hanging off the back mounts, all that kind of stuff. All, the, all those things work great. Um, I have a uh, master's degree in mechanical engineering. I worked in the nuclear power field for a long time. Ultrasound was one of the things that I worked with. We looked for um, uh, cracks and breaks in materials in these power plants um, in the piping systems, equipment, that kind of stuff. So fish finders and, elect and electronics in that manner, that's what I did you know, for my, uh, my entire career. Um, in uh, talking about transducers, um, we got some younger guys in here who may not have kids. We have some, some fellows that may not have kids. We have some ladies that may, may or may not have kids. It's the same thing. The old uh, ultrasound on the belly thing, or if they're looking for your kidney stones or whatever, it's exactly the same product. It's the same principle. Everything is exactly the same. Ultrasound is ultrasound is ultrasound. That transducer is the same thing that they wipe all, all over the, the belly to find out if you're having a boy or a girl or find that kidney stone or, or, or whatever. Um, one of the things to remember um, one of the most important things is uh, it, you just can't, you can't have a transducer mounted in air. It has to have a liquid or a solid or a gel to be able to, to penetrate. That's why they work in water because, you know, it's, it's a liquid. Will it go through a kayak hole? It's a solid. Yeah, absolutely. As long as it doesn't have air somewhere in between the two. Air is, is uh, like the stop sign for, um, for a transducer. If there's any air, it's not going to be able to work. If you want to mount a transducer inside your kayak, you can do it with a liquid bed or gel bed. You can epoxy it down, you know, anything like that. As long as you're going from a solid, a gel, a solid to a liquid without any air, mount it wherever you want. Doesn't doesn't make any difference. I've seen guys take a piece of PVC pipe and glue that into their um, into their kayak, fill it with water, and put their transducer in there because they didn't want their transducer to be it's fine, perfectly fine. Glue it down. They make the little kits, you know, where you can where you can glue them down. If you hang it over the side, whatever, it, it all works absolutely fine. Um, is it going to affect? the um uh, uh the readout of your of your fish finder absolutely not um i could go into some ad advanced math and science and you know this kind of stuff and explain it to you but um basically there's a crystal inside that acts like a drum head it the the machine sends a signal to the drum head and it vibrates and that's what sends the sound down then the sound comes back and it causes the crystal to vibrate and that sends a signal to the display well there's a pause in between the two because it can't talk and listen at the same time. So there's a pause. So there's an area right below your transducer that's called the dead zone. Um, it's typically about 12 inches in, uh, in most um, uh, fishing transducers. It's about 12 inches. Um, that's why um, in, your, in your kayak, if you get in really shallow water, it flashes or it won't, you know, it won't tell you. I'm in a foot of water, I can see, but it's, you know, well, that's that dead zone. It cannot read anything within that first, that first foot. Um, advanced algorithms algorithm, and, and things in there, it doesn't, if it's an eight feet, it's not seven feet. You know, it doesn't disregard that, that, that 12 inches, but you just can't read anything in that 12 inches. So if you've got a kayak or if you've got fiberglass or if you're shooting at the bird or whatever, within that 12 inches, it's not going to see that. So it's, you know, they, they put, um, they, they glue transducers in, you know, million dollar yachts, you know, that, that shoot right through the, um, right through the hull. So don't have any fear with gluing it in your kayak and think that I'm going to lose any sensitivity or, or anything like that. If anybody tells you you're going to lose that sensitivity, give them my email address. I'll be able to send them documents and, uh, you know, of information and inundate them with, with formulas and tell them, you know, actually why that's not going to happen. The one thing that you are going to lose is temperature because it only reads where it's at. So if you've got a, a machine that reads temperature and you mount it inside your kayak, you can know how musty it is inside your kayak rather than getting actual water temperature. Does water temperature matter? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely it does. I may find an area that's got um, uh, a creek outflow that I didn't know. It's five degrees cooler over here. Why are all the redfish over here? Because it's 90 degrees everywhere else. So temperature does, does absolutely make a difference. Um, power sources, fuses, and wiring. Everything is, everything is 12 volt. Um, 
the, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming they probably have them in the business here. The uh, exit signs that go over the, the doors, you know, that light up when the power goes out. That's the same battery that we use in our, in our kayaks. It's a 12 volt rechargeable battery. You can buy them on eBay for $15. There's no reason to, you know, to spend 50, 60, $100 on an expensive battery. The kits, Hobie's got one of the kits, and I think there's other manufacturers that have the kits. Those are really simple, easy, fantastic units. It's got everything all rolled into one. So if you don't want to piece it all together, if you just want to give me something I can plug in, you know, those things are, you know, they're, they're a little more expensive, but it's worth it if you don't want to have to go through all of the, all of the work. Um, if you're going to do your own um, electronics, please use marine grade wiring and please install a marine grade fuse um, in there. Most of them are three amp or five amp or something like that. The little bayonet fuses. Um, there was something floating around on the internet not too long ago. A guy's kayak was just, you know, completely melted. He had used, you know, substandard materials and, you know, in, it would happen in the yard. It didn't happen on the water, you know, fortunately. And it just, you know, it was enough heat that it was able to, you know, to melt the thing. It was the wires. He didn't have a fuse in there and it just, you know, melted, you know, melted his kayak. So just use the proper stuff. Um, marine grade wiring from West Marine or anywhere like that. It may cost twice as much as what you get at the auto store. We're talking about 10 bucks, so, though, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an incredible, um, uh, fee. Okay, this is a nice shot of one of my one of my fish finders here, and there's a couple things that I want to want to show you. First of all, even on the flats, here we are on the flats. Um, you can see there's an island there. There's a kayak right there. So I'm obviously in pretty shallow water. Two and a half feet is what I'm reading right there. But look what you see on the screen. It's two and a half feet here. It's a whole lot deeper here, and then it's shallow, and then it's deep. I've got an area here where I've got a couple of big potholes. You know, this is one of those areas I was talking about that I can find on the flats. Um, one of the things that I discuss in my um, it's dissect. Not just, it's not just waves bringing you up. Well, I mean, look at look at the water. You see how you know how smooth the water. If I was in the ocean, it, you know, yeah, then it would probably be a more of a regular you know type of a thing. Um, but uh, one of the things that I talk about in, in dissecting the flats is I don't care what the tide is. I can catch a fish. If it's a low tide or if it's a high tide, I can catch a fish. This is a very good example for that. If it's high tide, it's deep. <laughs> The fish are going to be sitting up here. If it's low tide, fish didn't disappear. They've got to go somewhere. They've got to, you know, get off. You know, the grass is sticking up out of the water, but they've got to go somewhere. That's where this is where they're at now. They found those deeper areas. They've gone down in this, these, these deeper these deeper pockets. So no matter what the tide is, I, I can find a fish. Just the use of, uh, of of that fish finder. This is one one of the uses for you know for that. This is a pretty more uh, uh, much more dramatic um, photograph. This is obviously a little bit of a deeper water. These are actually redfish. Uh, this is Jacksonville. Um, and one of either this slide or the next slide, one of these fish, um, this is this is off my son's kayak. One of these won him the Jacksonville Classic uh, Redfish Division. So one of these actual images you see on the screen here was a fish that he that he ended up catching for that. So um, nice arches. Um, I set up my machines. I don't want to see little pictures of fish because all that is is if the fish finder sees something that's not attached to the bottom, it puts up a fish picture. I want to see that arch. I want to see this rather than a glob of, of whatever. So that's one of the, I, you know, I don't want to see fish, fish pictures. But, but we got a, a school of red, uh, and these are big redfish. These are 35, 40 inch. These are, these are big redfish. Um, we got a couple of other things going on in the image here. Um, these two different color changes right here, we've got some rocks on the bottom. Now this is something when you get a fish finder, there's some great videos on YouTube and things like that to learn how to use that particular um, that, that particular fish finder. Learn how to use the fish finder, and you'll know the difference between between a rock and a stump. You know, in, in no time, it's not that difficult. On this side of the screen, we've got a school of bait, and these these, these redfish were actually feeding on um, white trout or silver trout or you know whatever you guys call them, um, sand sand trout. The little guys they look like a speck, but they're white. They're about this big. So these guys were basically feeding on you know on them. So during this particular um, um, uh, fishing expedition. We were looking for the schools of bait, dropping our bait down, trying to get those big, uh, those big redfish to, beat, to, to bite. And in this image, I think you can see, we've got some redfish, we've got a rock, and you can actually see, boom, 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 boom. That's a jig going up and down on the bottom. That's actually oh, wow. a, a DOA swimming mullet, the big white DOA swimming oh, mullet. Yeah. They're feeding white, on white trout, so one of those things uh, filled with, <coughs> filled with procure, bouncing off the bottom, ends up uh, winning in first place in um, the Jack's Classic. So. Nicety, necessity, that's up to you guys, but there's, you know, it, it also, it's a cool thing to have, you know, when you're fishing on the water. Just, you know, it, it gives, you, gives you something else to do on the water. Um, using the GPS, you can log your tracks, you know, you can see, you know, how far you've traveled. You can come home and tell your wife, hey, I paddled for 17 miles today, or, you know, whatever, so. All right, we're going to get into the big three. These are our target, our target species that basically we're covering, uh, you know, in this. All the gear that we talked about is, is for that. Uh, everybody can identify these three fish. We all know what those are. Everybody's caught one of those fish. Everybody knows what we're looking at. Okay, all right. All right.
let's talk about how these things are built. If we talk about how these things are, how these animals are set up, maybe we can um, catch them a little more uh, efficiently. So uh, we got the old speckled trout here. Um, his mouth and his eyes are upward, and he's got teeth, but no pronounced crushers. Doesn't doesn't necessarily have big uh, uh, big crushers. Um, I love to eat trout. One of my favorite fish to, to eat, nice and white. I eat them worms and all. Don't even care about that. But when you've cleaned a trout, you got that big leathery white funky thing that's in there that a knife won't go through. Swim bladder. Okay. They have a huge swim bladder. What that what that it does is, if you think about a little balloon and a big balloon, if you add a little bit of air to a little balloon, you affect it greatly. If you add a little bit of air to a big balloon, it doesn't necessarily affect it. So if you want to have minute changes in the way you're balancing, the big balloon is better because you can add a little and move a millimeter. Whereas if you had a small balloon and you added a little bit, you'd move a centimeter. So the larger swim bladder allows them to be able to move themselves a little bit more accurately than, uh, than, than some other fish. Okay, these guys, eyes forward, mouth in an upward position. They're designed to feed in an upward position. Um, with that swim bladder, it gives them the ability to hover. Most trout sit in one place and they wait for fish. You know, they're an ambush feeder for the most part. Um, Will a, shrimp, will a trout eat a shrimp? Yeah, absolutely. Everything eats a shrimp, man. Everything but, you know, but Uncle, Uncle Marge eats shrimp. But if you're going to if you're going to eat a meal and you have to hunt that meal, do you want to eat M&Ms or do you want to eat a T-bone? You want the biggest meal you can possibly get for the least amount of effort. Trout, especially big trout, feed almost exclusively on finfish, mullet, pinfish, pigfish, a thin fish, something, you know, an, an actual fish. So if I'm going to target trout, I may not use as many shrimp baits as I do fish imitating imitating baits, especially if I'm fishing for you know for a big trout. I'm going to use something that imitates a fish more than anything. Okay, we're going to talk about the science behind the size the size limits a little bit because I think it's important that everybody understands why we have the size limits that we do. 25 inch fish. That's a nice. That's a nice fish. 25 inch fish is a is a trophy in my in my in my opinion. I, I think a 25 inch trout weighs about five pounds. Typically, once a trout gets to 20 inches, it's about a pound per inch on a healthy fish. So a 21, you know, weighs a pound. A 22 weighs two. A 23 weighs three, four, and on up. That that that's pretty close. Um, in March, the fish will be their heaviest, so they'll have more eggs, and they'll definitely be that weight. Sometimes later in the summer, when it's hot and they're not eating as much and they're really skinny, they might, may not be quite that heavy. But it, you know, if you catch a 25-inch trout, you can pretty much figure that's that's a five-pound fish. That's what one looks like. In case you guys haven't seen a 25-inch trout, um, how old's that fish? Hands. How old's a 25-inch trout? Four years. Four years. Hold, uh, see, uh, hands. Hands. You can put your hand down because you were wrong anyway. <laughs> anybody else want to guess? Anybody have an idea? Yes, sir. A year and a half. Yeah, a Twenty-five inch, uh, twenty-five inch trout. A year and a half? No, not even close. What do you think? Nine, ten years. Not, not quite. We're getting closer. Like seven. Not, not quite. Not quite. Five years. Five, five years. Yeah, absolutely. Five years. Yeah, yeah. She's five years old. Uh, green, black, or blue? Um, I'll take the green. Green. Sorry if I'm taking away sales from the shop. I didn't mean to. So, yeah. Maybe everybody will want one and they'll rush and get one. So, yeah, these at that size are almost all female, um, and she's about she's about five years old. Um, there's an old wives' tale that says if you catch a trout and they grunt, have you ever caught one that makes a noise? Those are males, and that's one of the ways they attract uh, females. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, you know, I've never thought about you know when I'm filleting them. Did this one grunt or not grunt? So I'm not completely sure. But I know if you catch a big trout, almost always they won't grunt. So it kind of makes it kind of makes sense. But they're um, they're almost always a female, and that's what we want to do is keep the breeders in the water. So once they get to that upper you know that upper limit, we want to keep those females you know in the in the water. So. All right, here we go. The old red monster. This fish is designed in a totally different way. Those eyes are almost all the way forward on their on their head, and they're focused in a downward manner. His mouth is absolutely on the bottom of his face, and they've got that old hard nose. Um, they um, they have pronounced crushers. You've seen the back of their throat, man. You wouldn't want to stick your finger back there because they can just they can just crunch it up. They have rubbery lips, and they have a relatively small swim bladder. They still have the ability to con all fish have the ability to control you know their um, uh, their flotation in the water there. But these guys are, are much smaller. These guys are obviously designed to feed in a downward 
uh, fashion, that hard nose, those big nostrils, you know, huge big nostrils on a redfish. Um, for the most part, they're going to feed mostly on crustaceans, fishy bits. Like we catch them on cut mullet or menhaden, you know, or anything like that. These guys are bottom feeders, so that's just all there is to it. You can glorify a redfish all you want, but they're bottom feeders, it, uh, but they're an absolute blast to catch. Now, does that mean that a redfish won't eat a topwater lure? Absolutely not. Of course they will. I've got plenty of redfish on a topwater lure. But for the most part, if I target my species where he's looking to eat, then I have a better chance of catching that particular fish. If I want to go out and catch redfish, I'm probably not going to throw topwaters all day. I'm probably going to be throwing something that's targeting more towards, uh, towards the bottom. All right, the science behind the, the, the limits, okay? 25-inch uh, fish, that's a great fish, probably weighs five, six pounds. They're much more, m much more dense, and especially when they're younger, you know, their, their bodies are a little bit fuller. When they get up to be a bull red size, you know, they can actually start losing a little bit of weight and they're more head, you know, than anything else. 25-inch uh, fish, is a, that's a fantastic, I, you know, I, I don't necessarily consider that a trophy, but that's a nice solid fish. I, I take that any day of the week. And if you don't know what a 25-inch redfish looks like, there's one. Um, how old is that fish? Hands. Six. Not even close. No, eight years. Eight, not even close. Really? 25. Twi not, not even close. Now, we're talking about a fish, you know, this long. Yes, sir? I was going to go the other direction. Three. Three years old. I like the way you think. Whoa. Three years old. We have some, we have some liberal yes. limits with a redfish. And that, now, think about, think about a bull red. I mean, these fish get to be 50 inches long. Yeah. Now you're talking about your 30, 40-year-old fish when they get to be that long. <laughs> There's a scad zillion of those 25 inches running around. They're fairly young. That's why we have that 18 to 27. We've got a nice range where we can keep them. But again, some of those are males and some of those are females. Once they get to be above that 25 inch range, almost all of them are females. So that's why we have that upper limit at 27. We want to let all those females um, grow up and do their thing. Uh, black, green, or blue? Blue. <coughs> yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You guys are learning a lot about uh, the age of fish here. Uh, we've got a lot of answers going all over the place. So, All right, how about this guy, man? This is, this is a dream for everybody to catch right here. That, that guy's awesome, right? Um, eyes are on the top of their head. If you guys have ever fished at night around the lights or have anybody, a friend that's got a dock or anything, if you look down at a snook, their eyes are on top of their head. You know, it looks like it's on the side, but if you look straight down at them, they're actually on the top of their head. Um, their mouth is much more forward. It's pronounced in an upward manner. They have a huge tail fin, so obviously this is, a, this is a fast guy, and everybody knows the lateral line. They've got one of the most pronounced lateral lines of, of any fish that swims. This guy is obviously an ambush feeder. He's got that big tail, sharp strikes to, to catch his prey. Um, and with those eyes on top and everything in an upward manner, he again is going to feed more in an upward manner. He's an, amb he's an ambush feeder. Again, he's got a large swim bladder like the trout does, so he has the ability to hover. One of the most famous ways to catch them down in my area is around the bridges where the current's running and that sort of stuff. They'll hover right behind a post or a piling and wait for stuff to, you know, to, to, to come by. They have the, uh, that ability to hover because they got that swim bladder and they're able to um, uh, control their, their depth uh, um, you know, a lot more precisely. They got that huge tail so they can dart out into, um, into traffic and grab something. That big mouth, you know, they're a suction feeder. You know, they love to, love to suck, uh, suck bait off the top, that kind of a thing. Now, these guys absolutely feed almost exclusively on fin fish. When you get to be that big, when you get to be a, you know, a large fish, again, you want the T-bone and not the M&M. So. so what does that mean? I'm going to use a larger bait. I'm going to use a bait that's more oriented towards the top or mid-depth or, or something like that. If I'm, gonna, if I'm fishing for snook, and I'll contradict the guys that throw those, uh, those big jigs and drag them across the bottom because absolutely that works. But if I'm going to target um, snook, I'm not going to be fishing on the bottom. I'm typically going to be you know, putting, putting the baits on the top or in the mid-depths or something, you know, something like that. The science behind the limits. 28-inch 28, uh, 28 fish that's in the slot, 7 or 8 pounds. You know, they're a nice, they're a nice, a nice, uh, depth, uh, nice dense fish. No quiz this time. Protandric hermaphrodite. That sounds like something dirty. It sounds like a website that you shouldn't be on, right? What that actually means is, and I think you guys are aware of this, snook actually change sexes. When they're small, they're all males, and at some point in their life cycle, they all become a female. And it's within that slot. It's within that, that, that 28, 30, 32 inch range, something like that. That's when they're all making that change, and they're becoming females. So anything larger than that, almost 100% of those are, are female. It's called protandric hermaphrodite. It means that an animal that can change from one sex to another. There are other fish and things that can do that. Frogs and you know other creatures that can change. <laughs> yeah, so. <Bruce> <laughs> <There you go. laughs> 
I should have worked that in there somewhere. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't think about that. So yeah, um, this fish is about four years old. So they're 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 fairly uh, a fairly rapid grower um, as well. Even more so than a trout. A trout is a more slow slow growing fish. That's why we have those 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 uh, smaller uh, limits on the trout, and why we're only able to keep the one you know the one trophy fish, because they are you know they don't they don't get nearly as large obviously, and they're a, little, a slower slower growing fish. All right, we're going to talk about hooks. Hooks is imp hooks are important. Hooks is important. Hooks are, are an important thing. That's our connection to the fish. And we talked about the size of the uh, the hook and the drag. So it's it's something that's really really important. Hook anatomy. I'm sure you guys know. You know, um, basically hook anatomy. Know what's, uh, you know, all the all the pieces parts of a hook. We're going to be concentrating on three different things with hooks: the overall size, the gap, and the wire size, which is incredibly important in some situations. Uh, and I've got a couple of photographs here. This one is um, designated as a 1X fine wire, and this one is a 3X strong. So this would be a fatter wire. It's a thicker wire. The actual wire that the hook is bent out of is a thicker diameter than, uh, you know, than, uh, than the norm. Okay, quiz time. Which of these hook manufacturers is made in the United States? There is only one right answer. Only one right answer. I think you came up first. Oh, no. You got some. That's wrong. Yeah, that's wrong. No, that's wrong. How about somebody over here? How about right here? Mustad. Mustad is absolutely wrong. Whoa. Yes, sir. Absolutely not. Oh, no. <laughs> How about you right here? The owner. Absolutely not. <laughs> How about you right here? Diachi. Absolutely not. <laughs> that a girl. There is not. There's not a single hook manufacturer in the United States anymore. Yeah. Yeah, the closest thing we had was Eagle Claw. They were, they're a Canadian-based company, but all the hooks are made in China. So, uh, yeah. No, yeah, everybody wants to use American and, you know, that kind of stuff. But, I mean, it's just kind of surprising that, you know, our American, American pastime, you know, fishing, all fish hooks now are made outside of the United States. Sounds like an opportunity. I've got, Especially when they're using mustard and Eagle Claw. I've got um, green or black? Um, green. Green it is. Just a, just an interesting little a anecdote, you know, that, uh, you know, people talk about, I want to use American and, you know, this kind of stuff. Even your lure manufacturers, 100% American, where'd you get your hooks? Yeah. You know, it, it, so. it's a shame, but the price of steel, uh, the machining, manufacturing, labor, you know, that kind of stuff, it's just, you know, it's so, so simple to, um, to let somebody do it for 20 cents an hour, I guess. Um, hooks that are on our lures. Now, the, hook man the, the lure manufacturers, they select a hook uh, an approximate, approximate, appropriate size for their lure, and they'll install those hooks on that lure, and they do all of their field testing, they do all of their tank testing, they do all of their testing with that particular hook. It's not just the size, it's the diameter. It is where the barb is, whether it's an outside barb or an inside barb. We have a couple of other terms here, a round bend, a straight bend, a reverse barb, and then a short shank. Um, this is a short, a short shank hook. You can see that the tip almost reaches the eyelet. This one's a little bit longer. And this one is probably longer, longer still. If you put this hook on this lure, it's going to change the way that it uh, that it moves. Maybe not drastically, but some. It's going to move differently than it did um, initially. Um, the reason I I, I I say this is because a lot of people say, oh, I change all my hooks. Oh, I change all my hooks. I had a conversation with a guy not too long ago. He didn't like the manufacturer that I was um, discussing. He says, well, their hooks are crap. I change all my hooks anyway. Do your lures still work the same way, you know, as, as they did, as they were intended? Maybe you invented something. Maybe you put a long shank where there was a short shank, and maybe your lures work better than, you know, they did before. But probably not, because the manufacturer probably has a pretty good idea of what he's doing. A lot of guys will take the treble hooks off of lures now and put the single hook or circle hook or something like that on there. I commend you, but I want to put fish in the boat. If, I, if there's any possibility for me to throw a treble hook, I'm going to. If I can attach more treble hooks to a lure, I would absolutely <laughs> do, 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 do that. So, yeah. Um, so, but if you but if you bend down the barbs, you know, or anything like that, I think that's fantastic. But I'm just I, I'm wanna, I'm I'm trying to put those fish, um, you know, in the boat. Um, if you're going to change the hooks, try to get something as close to what the ma original manufacturer had, and you're going to have, um, you know, the, the similar you know results. But if you want to tamper, play, you know, that kind of stuff, you may come up with something. You know, there's always that always that opportunity. Um, electrolysis, galvanic corrosion, carbon steel hook, stainless steel ring. Stainless steel here. Again, we talked about washing, rinsing, putting a little bit of, bit of oil in there. You can see these hooks probably need some attention. But I think if you look at these particular baits, they're probably beat up, chewed up, and ready for the graveyard, you know, anyway. So, yeah. Um, so, to take care of them, just like you would any, um, any of your other uh, equipment. My bait hooks. I fish with live bait. I fish with dead bait. I have no problem with that. One of the things to pay attention to with a live bait hook is, 
I'm going to adjust just a little bit because I think most of the information is on this other side. Okay. These two hooks, they're obviously two different sizes, but look at the thickness of this wire versus the thickness of that wire. It's a much thicker wire. It's a, one of them is, a, is, a, is a, a standard wire and one of them is a light wire. This particular manufacturer, I think, is, um, I think this is an owner Mutu light wire, and then this is the standard. So the size that I'm using of that hook, whether it's a big hook or a small hook, it has more to do with the fish you know, that I'm trying to catch. If I'm trying to catch a trout, probably going to use a smaller hook. If I'm after um, black drum and I'm going to use a half a crab, I'm probably going to use a bigger hook. Big rubbery lips. If I'm using a circle hook, I've got to have the gap wide enough to hook into that rubbery, gumky part of his, you know, his mouth. Where a trout has a little thinner mouth and I can use a smaller, get away with a smaller hook. That's one of my, you know, one of my considerations. And with that consideration, tighter, loose of the drag because I'm using a, a smaller or larger hook. Um, uh, wide enough to allow the hook in the jaw, the thicker wire. Uh, if I'm using a live bait, if I'm using, um, let's just use sh shrimp for an example. If I'm using shrimp and I use this thick wire hook and I'm trying to go, you know, between the two spots underneath this horn, I'm probably going to damage organs or a brain or something like that. That thick wire hook is really going to, you know, uh, um, damage my bait. Um, if I'm using um, live mullet or pinfish or something like that, and whether I hook them through the nose or the back or however you, you know, choose to hook them, um, that thick wire is going to cause a lot of damage to that, to that fish. He's not going to be able to, um, to live quite as long if, as, as if I use a small wire hook. Now I have to take that into consideration, that small wire hook can bend, but again, if my hook bends, I sh probably should have had my drag a little bit looser anyway. I need to think about, uh, about that when I'm setting my drag. I'm using a light wire hook. Maybe I'll give them a little extra drag. So, um, Also, the thicker wire restricts his bait movement. If I've got that gigantic thick wire hook in a shrimp, man, he's really having to work to swim with that big hook in his, in his head. So I w might want to use a smaller hook for a, sh a shrimp and a larger hook for a, a, you know, a dead crab or, or something like that. All right, jig heads. I don't do a lot of jig head fishing. It's, it's not something that I, that I do um, in my, my type of fishing. Unless I'm fishing um, deeper water with a soft plastic, I just I don't carry a lot of jig heads um, with me. There's actually none in that tackle box. I don't, unless I'm doing something specific, I don't typically fish with, uh, with jig heads. But it is an important part of your arsenal, and everybody needs to um, you know, understand there's some differences in the jig heads. With these particular jig heads, um, Boy, we've all bought these at Walmart for $1.99 a pack, and those, man, what are, what are we thinking? We're just trying to save a few bucks, but that's a terrible, uh, a terrible jig head. Um, basically, a jig head is a piece of lead with a hook in it. All these manufacturers, you know, knew this, knew that. Man, it's a piece of lead, you know, in a hook. They didn't make the hook. They bought the hook from somewhere, and it probably came from China. But an owner hook or a VMC hook or some other quality hook to begin with, if you start out with a good product, then you're going to end up with a good product. I want that quality hook because that's what's attaching me to that fish. So I'm going to buy uh, a, a quality jig head because I want that quality hook to begin with. If you look at these, I've got these two are more round, but you'll see how they actually stand up. If you drop the thing, it rolls itself up with the hook in an upright, in an upright position. Um, the other two lay flat. They're, they're actually more sh shaped more like, um, like an arrowhead. Now, that doesn't mean one is better than the other. They're actually designed for two totally separate things. These jig heads are designed to fish a bait on the bottom. I want my bait to settle onto the bottom, but I want that hook to be up. I don't want it to be dragging across the bottom and hooking on the oysters or catching every piece of grass, and I don't necessarily want my fish to pay, pick up the bait and miss the hook. So if I'm, gonna, if I'm dragging a soft plastic or, or along the bottom for a redfish or a flounder, these are probably better choices here. Now, if I'm going to use um, a paddle tail and I'm going to cast and reel, cast and reel, I'm trying to cover a flat or something like that, and I want it to come through the water a little more streamlined, I don't want it to catch that uh, floating vegetation, I want to be able to, um, to, to drag it on in without, um, without a lot of uh, hesitation, these are probably better choices because they're made to come through the water. They're more of an airhead shape. So there's not, not other than this one is a pretty poor quality hook. The shape of those heads make um, you know make a difference as far as um, as, ha as how the bait is going to work. This one I can cast and reel, cast and reel this just fine, but it is wider. It has a little more chance of catching you know um, uh, weeds, you know that kind of stuff. It's going to be a little bit slower coming through the through the water, but um, you know it's just it's, it's designed to um, you know to be fished on the bottom more than more than anything. Okay, hooks and soft plastics. We have the same type of thing going on here. If you look at they're very subtle, but the changes in wire diameter between these three hooks. I have three different manufacturers, three totally different hooks. This one is just rusted to death. It's been sitting in my little oil, oil tub for too long. Um, but I've got different diameters of wire. These are obviously weighted, so they're, they're, going, to, they're going to fall a little bit faster. They're going to sink a little, bit, um, a little bit faster anyway than the one that's unweighted. But even with the unweighted hooks, I can get a thin wire, I can get a thick wire. Um, 
if I'm dealing with fish that are extremely spooky and I've got to throw as light a bait as possible and I, you know, I'm just having a hard time getting a bait in front of them when I'm spooking, I may want to switch to a much, much lighter wire. If I'm fishing in really shallow water and I want that bait to sink very, very slowly, I may switch to a lighter wire hook. Um, it makes a difference. Uh, this is one of those, one, those little subtle things that can absolutely make a difference. When I use a weighted, uh, a weighted soft plastic, I don't, want it, I don't want it down in the mud. I don't want it to sink. That's one of the reasons that I don't use jig heads. I want it on top of the grass. I want it to slowly settle. If a pinfish hides in the grass from a redfish, he doesn't bury himself down in the mud. He stays right there, you know, hovering in that grass. That's what I want my bait to do. I don't want it to sink like a stone all the way to the bottom. But there are times where there's vegetation that I do need to punch through, or there's a little bit of current, or I am fishing in six feet of water and I want that bait to get to the bottom quicker than, you know, than a, an unweighted hook where I'll need a little bit more weight, that kind of a thing. Subtle, subtle changes. It affects the rate of fall. Um, there's a lot of times that I'll use a jerk bait. <coughs> I'll throw it out there, and I want the thing to sink nice and slowly. I want it to sink a little bit, you know, a little bit more rapidly. It, it affects the rate of fall. These weighted hooks, you know, I can actually slide the weight forward, or I can slide the weight backwards. If I slide it forward, my bait's going to fall nose down. If I slide it backwards, it's going to have a tendency to fall basically in a horizontal fashion. It's going to fall more like a natural presentation of a, of a fish that's, you know, that's sick or trying to hide. They don't, they don't swim you know, straight down. They're going to you know, settle like this. Um, a lot of the soft plastics that we use today have um, a split in their belly. Um, that actually can act as um, I don't know, wings. You know? they, they don't actually open up, but I mean, a little bit of, that little bit of water tension in that thing can actually flutter as it, you know, as it goes to the bottom. I love that about those, the soft plastic. It's made to, you know, for your hook to slid, slip in or whatever, but it actually you know, can help that bait fall in just a, a beautiful natural presentation. Um, they got two, two different manufacturers. It's basically the same hook, two different manufacturers. Look how thick that wire is compared to that wire. When you look at them side by side next to each other, you can really see a difference between, you know, between the two. This one is probably going to be twice as heavy you know, a, as that one. It's a subtle thing. When you pick up hooks from two different manufacturers, you may not be able to, to necessarily notice it, but it, it can be one of those subtle differences where I want something to fall just a little bit faster than, than the other. It's not a lot of weight. It's just a hook with a weight on it. But when you're attaching it to a soft plastic, it can, you know, the rate of fall can be, you know, two or three feet, you know, at, you know, difference, you know, at a time. So, let's talk about weedless. Which one of those is weedless? Well, they both are. It's both the same crappy white um, jerk shad you got on there. Look at the front of this and look at the front of this. Which one do you think is going to be more weedless? On the right. Well, it makes a difference. You know, we're talking about differences, you know, in hooks. Well, I prefer this. I prefer that. Well, if I'm fishing. Um, a mosquito Lagoon and it's a day that the wind's got all the grass, you know, a lot of submerged grass, that kind of stuff. Man, if I have to pick grass off my lure every fifth cast, that's 20% of my day that's wasted. Uh, I want something that's going to be completely weedless. Now, that's not to say that I'm not going to use this. I love, I love that little screw lock thing because it, it saves baits. I don't go through quite as many where this actually rips and tears. That's where I got to get my little super glue out and put everything back together. Um, but this is going to be a lot more, uh, a lot more weedless. I may want, um, you know, uh, uh, a little more weight, you know, so I may use something like that. These hooks, typically, this type of weedless hook, they don't come weighted because you have to actually slide the bait through it, and it would tear it, you know, if you had to slide it over the weight, you know, right there. So, um, but yeah, it's much, much more weedless. Um, that's a good tip. Put that in your, uh, in your little tool bag. Use the appropriate size hook for the bait. Now we got two different baits here: a big bait and a little bait, and I've kind of exaggerated it here. This is obviously way too big of a hook for this particular bait. And this is pretty small for this bait as far as length, but not just the length. Look at the thickness of this bait and look how much gap I've got right here. If a fish bites this right here, he may or may not be able to get to the pointy end of the hook um, because it may not penetrate all the way through the bait. This would be a much better choice because it has a much wider gap in this bait. So when a fish bites it, my hook, the point of my hook is going to pop up a, a, a lot more easier. So not only the length, you know, if a fish picks up the tail, you may, he may never find the you know, the barb, but the, but, the, um, but the gap as well. One of those little small things that makes a difference. When I hear guys say, man, I've been throwing this soft plastic all day, and, you know, I keep getting bites, but, I, you know, I, they're on for a second, and then, you know, then they, and I look at the bait, and I'm like, what, how about using a 5 aught instead of a 2 aught? Maybe, you know, the gap size will make a difference, you know. Do you have a, a preference of not using a weighted, because uh, it seems like a lot of your pictures are without weight. I use both, and, and, and in a lot of cases, um, and I, I use them both. Um, it de de well, it depends on the depth. It depends on the location, you know, that I'm fishing. It depends on the particular bait that I'm, you know, that I'm using. Um, if I'm using something like a jerk shad, like this, like this bait here, um, 
uh, that's if I can use that unweighted, that's really what I would prefer. Um, if I'm fishing for trout or if I'm fishing for snook, uh, I'm typically going to use it unweighted. And that's something I'm going to get into when we talk about working the, the water column. If I'm fishing for redfish, I want it on the bottom. That's when I'm typically going to use, uh, use that weight is I'm going to be able to keep it down closer to the bottom. Um, these cool little things right here, they sell them at Bass Pro Shops. I don't know what they're called. They've got them in the soft plastic department. If you attach it to a jig head or a hook, you can make anything weedless. I mean, there it is right there. You know, it's, I, I, I could use a bigger jig head so it would have better penetration. But this is, if you love using jig heads, but you got them just catching weeds every single time, yeah, maybe this is something you ought to throw in your in your tackle box. It's so. They, they, you know, they make you know. I mean, you've got the built-in weed catchers. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot, of, a lot of the hooks do, and I think the the jig manufacturers are catching on. But you can buy a bag of those things for about two bucks. There's like 20 of them in there. So just a. What kind of uh, uh, jig is that? The jig head. Yeah. Um, oh. No, the, uh, the bait. The bait that is a Berkeley power bait. Okay. Uh, it looks like a mullet. I took, it's, oh yeah, it, this this right here is key right here. That that big eyeball right there. Yeah, fish can see that a mile away. That's a that's a that's a great bait. Yep, yep. These um and again we we're talking about the 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 split and I'm going to say it because that's what I call it. That's the vagina. That bait the vagina. I'm sorry, but that also is a great place for me to fill with um, uh, procure. I'll put my my procure right down you know through there that way the water is not you know washing it off immediately it gets to stay in there you know a little bit i use a, i go through a lot of procure uh I, you know i really i really love this stuff fish have nostrils you know for a reason um all right we're going to get into lures uh, plugs lures top, top water baits mid water baits that kind of thing as i said before if i can throw something with a treble hook that's what I want to do. I, I want to throw a treble hook every every single time. I, I've got a lot of pictures of the soft plastics because that's just what we were going through with the hooks here, for the most part. Okay. When we when I when I'm going to select the baits that I'm going to use, I want to work the water column. Let's talk let's talk about the water column. <clears throat> we have the top, the surface. We have mid column, and then we have the bottom. It's pretty basic. But the surface isn't just the layer that's right on the top. The surface could actually be six feet. If I'm fishing in 40 feet of water you know the surface is you know is, is a lot on the top um, when I'm talking about mid column it could be anywhere in that you know in that 40 feet just as I showed the slide with the redfish you know on the bottom I'm fishing the, you know the bottom It's 40 feet deep so I'm obviously focusing on the you know on the bottom it wouldn't do me any good to use mid-depth baits um, you know in that uh, in that area so um, when I work the water column I'm going to think about the species that I'm targeting and a lot of people you know say man I'm, I just want to catch fish dude I don't want to you know worry about which fish I just want to throw it out there and if something bites it bites and I understand that I think that, that there's not, absolutely nothing wrong with that take a, take a bait and throw it and you know if you catch a snook a redfish a flounder a trout a mullet whatever it's, it's, that's awesome but if you if you want to go out this weekend and catch I'm fishing for redfish look I really want to catch a redfish Think about that species. Think about the way he feeds. Think about the way he's set up. Think about the morphology of that fish. Present the baits where he is looking for food, and your odds are, are absolutely going to um, going to increase. When I'm thinking about the water column, also, I'm thinking about the time of day. Um, how many times have you guys seen a fish blink? Yeah, fish don't have eyelids. No blinking, right? Uh, do you think the sun affects them the way it does us? Absolutely. Fish have got to hide from the sun just, uh, just like anything. So early in the morning, night, late in the evening, fish are more t have more tendency to be in shallow water because the light's not affecting their eyes nearly as much, whether that's a bait or a, um, uh, a predator species, um, either way. So the time of day is going to dictate how I fish the water column as well. I'm not going to be throwing a topwater lure at noon. Uh, and my odds are, are, are pretty small. Um, the, the water clarity, again, the light affects, uh, you know, the fish's eyes. It affects how they're going to feed. Um, in, if I'm in dingy water, I may need to use something that's a little more noisy um, as opposed to something that's a little bit more, more, more um, subtle. Uh, turbidity, water, is the water rough? We have waves. Is everything nice and slick and smooth? If it's a beautiful, calm, slick day, people see that out on the lagoon and think, oh, man, what a beautiful day. It's like a sheet of glass. And they throw that top water lure and they say, man, I don't I fished all day. I don't know why I didn't catch any on the top water lure. My God, you scared everything away for, you know, for a mile. If it's a little choppier, you're going to have better, better odds of, of catching a fish with that top water lure. Um, water temperature, hot versus cold, it affects a fish. They're cold-blooded animals. So when it's hot, they're laying up in the shade, drinking a margarita, having a siesta. You know, and if it's cold, it's the same way. They're bundled up around a fire somewhere. So, you know, that, that can affect it. If I'm going to fish... When it's extremely hot, I'm probably going to be fishing in deeper water. I'm probably going to be fishing in shady areas. I'm going to try to find a creek that's got some cooler water, and I'm going to be focused on the bottom, something that's a little more slowly. So, working that water column, thinking about the, the fish and how they act, that's how I'm going to, you know, how I'm going to approach tying on those lures at the beginning of the day. 
basically the three types of lures that um, you know that we're all going to use. We're going to use a top water bait. We're going to use a mid mid water type of a bait, and we're going to use something that uh, that um, is attached to the bottom. We're talking about top water baits, we got a pretty nice selection there. Can you guys name all of them? Everybody, all, everybody ought to be able to name at least one. We got a uh, uh, Papar, Badonkadonk. Uh, that's a live target. That's an unfair mullet. That is a she dog. How about that one? Yeah. That was one Grandpa used. Yeah. Some of you, some of you guys that are a little more silver. I'll remember that one. Yeah. That's a that's a devil's horse. Yeah. This one you guys may not know. That's an unfair lures um, uh, version of their of their popper. But um, each one of these does something a little bit differently and does it in a little bit different ways. These guys right here, these big these big poppers. Man, they're noisy. Clunk, 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 coming through the water. Um, do I want that noise or do I want something that's a little more, more subtle? Something like that live tar target or the unfair mullet, this guy has no rattles, no nothing. He doesn't make any noise coming through the water. So he's really, really subtle. On a really slick day when it's really quiet, I probably want that more subtle um, presentation. Um, I'm also probably going to fish it more slowly as well. A calm day, I'm probably going to slow everything down, make it a little more quiet. I'm trying to be quiet. Shh, you know, I want to do the same thing for the fish. You know, they want it quiet as well. Um, you can scare them a little more easily. Um, a, a day when it's <coughs> when it's windy, water's dark. I want something that makes the most noise I can. That sheet dog right there, man, that is a trout killing machine. Uh, something about those high pitch rattles, you know, and that chrome and black. That's money right there. Uh, I've got more trout over 25 inches on that thing than I have anything else. That's a fantastic bait right there. So, um, rough water conditions, I want to make I want to make more noise. Calm water conditions, I want it to be a little more quiet. Ah, uh, here's a a great bonus tip. And for some reason, the picture. I lost the picture. How strange is that? It was on here and now it's gone. I have another picture with that bonus tip on there and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get back to it. But basically, um, an unweighted soft plastic rig to cast when a fish misses the top water. We've all had that. You, you're throwing that, that spook and boom, she blows up. God, she jumps all the way out of the water, but he never gets a hook. Man, I give it about I get about three tries. I pick up a soft plastic and I throw it right there and I just let it sink. Nine times out of ten, she slams it. Because when that trout or that snook, redfish totally different. When they hit that bait, they're not trying to eat it, they're trying to kill it. It's a whole lot easier to eat a steak after it's been cooked than to try out wrestle them to the ground and take a take a bite out of it. They're actually trying to stun it, kill it. I don't want it wiggling. They're trying to stun the bait, have it become injured, dead, whatever, and then they'll, they'll come back around and eat the thing. So they hit it once, twice, three times. They're like, man, this thing won't die. I'm leaving it alone. But you throw a soft plastic out there. That little, um, yeah. that little uh, Berkeley bait that I had on there just looks like a little mullet. You, let that thing, you just throw that thing out there and let it sink quiet, you know, quietly, and man, she will grab that thing every time. Because she thinks she's killed it, and here it is. It's floating down real slow. Bam, grab it. That's money. All right, fishing on the bottom. We'll go to the mid depths next. Um, I don't want my baits buried buried up in the mud. I, I really, you know, I, I don't want I don't want a redfish to have to dig to try to catch my bait. So I use as light a bait as I possibly can. As I said, I don't use a lot of um, a lot of jig heads. I use mostly the weighted hooks. And I got a couple of different things going on here. I've got a paddle tail. I've got a jerk shad. I got a smaller paddle tail. This is that little Berkeley thing, and I got a couple. Of, I think these are voodoo shrimp. Those are great little baits. I love the voodoo shrimp. The Savage Gear Shrimp, that's another one. I really like that little Savage Gear Shrimp because it's basically weedless. Um, I don't want it to be too heavy. I want it to settle on top of the grass or on top of the mud or on top of an oyster. I don't want it to bury itself down. I want it to be as light as I possibly can, can get the thing. I don't want it to, to sink. This is a fantastic method in the Mosquito Lagoon. We've got those fish that are just absolutely pounded to death. Tampa's another place where I use this technique. It's just absolutely pounded to death. They've seen every lure known to mankind. The redfish that are in there, the residents, they've been living there for 30 years. You know, they've seen every lure. They've seen lures you've never even seen before. You throw everything in the world at them and they're gonna turn their nose up at it. But I can almost guarantee you every time if I throw a bait out there in front of a school of redfish, five fish, three fish, eight fish, as long as there's multiple fish, and I don't move it, I throw it out there and I leave it alone. Eventually, one of those schoolboys is going to nudge the other schoolboy, and he's going to see it, and he's going to say, I got to have that, and he'll reach down and grab it. He's not spooked, but he wants to grab it before anybody else does. Dead stick it. You throw it out there in front of him and let it sit. If it has a natural color, if it has a natural profile, and especially if it has any kind of a scent on it, they're going to pick it up. 
And that doesn't mean I'm going to throw it out there and leave it sit all day. But when I talk about dead stick, and I talk, I'm talking about throwing it out in front of them and not moving. If you twitch it a millimeter, you may spook them. But if you throw it out there and you leave it, you'll be surprised at how many times a fish will, will pick that. Just thinking about redfish specifically, that's not to say that a trout won't do the same thing. But redfish specifically, because they are hammered so much and they can be so so skittish, they know you're there. Whether you're in a kayak or a boat, they know you're there. They, they've known you there. You were there when you pulled up on the flat. So. Until they passed, you know, once they go past and they haven't done it, I'm going to try to turn and, you know, do it again or look for the next, you know, the next group. So, but um, probably seven times out of ten, one of them is going to pick it up. It, as long as I don't move it and there's nothing else to spook them, you know, nothing, you know, nothing like that. So, and it, it, whether it's a shrimp type of a bait or a, a, even a paddle tail or, you know, a, a gulp, you know, is a fantastic bait for that. You don't have to actually add a, add um, scent to the gulp, but anything like that, you know, just don't, don't move it. Leave it sit. You'll be surprised. You know, experiment the next time you see a you know school fish like that. Instead of trying to throw it directly at them, throw it out in front of them. Just let it sit and just see what happens. Um, here again, uh, hook weight can affect the fall rate. So uh, you know I'm going to be careful if I'm in shallow water, deep water. If it's clear water, I may want it to uh, fall a little bit more slowly than you know, than if it was in uh, darker water. Um, the, these things can be the finesse bait, like we're talking about, to throw it out there and hop it in in front of those schooling fish or something like that. But they can, they can also be a search bait. The paddle tails, cast and reel, cast and reel, cast and reel, perfectly fine. I do the same thing with these guys. This guy and this guy right here, cast, chirp, 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 chirp. I, I fish it just as fast as I would a lure. I would fish it in the same way. And that little soft plastic, especially when it's unweighted, it doesn't come through the water straight. Man, it comes through the water just all over the place. That loop knot helps, helps do that. Really, really erratic. I use it as a search bait. I'll throw it out there and I'll fish it flat all day. Give it the old jerk, 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 let it pause. Sometimes let it sink, whatever. It's a search bait. Same as I would a, a mirrodine or, you know, or anything like that. So, um, The soft landing, uh, something that doesn't have a, a weight on it. It's a soft plastic. Rather than throwing, if I see a school of redfish coming, Man, I'm not throwing a mirrodine at him. I'm going to pick up a soft plastic because I want it to just make as slight a splash that I, you know, that I possibly can. So with the soft plastics, you know, you know that's more of a subtle type of a pr presentation rather than trying to get their attention. I really want it to be you know, more quiet than anything. I can actually, with, uh, with this type of thing, where's my button? Uh-oh, I killed it. Nope. Um, I can walk the dog with that thing. You get it up on top, and you get the right motion going, and choop, 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 choop. but it's really, really quiet, and at any point in time, if a fish blows up on it, now I can stop, and it's going to slowly sink. He thinks he's killed it. Bam, he's going to grab it. That's a great technique. If I want to fish top water, and it's weedy, you know, there's a lot of sur surface grass, and I can't use a spook or something like that, you know, too many trouble hooks, fantastic. I'll tell you something else. The bass guys use a frog. I've caught many a redfish on a frog, and, and it's, really? it's weedless. You better believe it. They don't. That's something swimming through the water. Redfish don't care. They'll just grab yeah, that thing. Yeah, so. there. <laughs> All right, mid depths. Um, this is what we typically think about as you know as, as search baits. This is something that we're going to cast and reel, cast and reel. And if you guys haven't noticed in all of my photographs, something that is absolutely missing, and that's a spoon. I don't throw a spoon. I can't stand a spoon. I cannot catch a fish on a spoon. I couldn't catch a, a, a redfish on a spoon at a redfish farm. I, I can't catch a fish on a spoon. <laughs> I, I don't I don't throw spoons because I just I can't make them work. Um, and again, uh, uh, treble hooks. If I can, if I can get away with treble hooks, um, that's what I want. Um, a little lip plug that doesn't run very, um, uh, very deep. Um, the rip and slash baits. This is um, Arrowhead, I think. That's another little rip and slash unfair lures. And I know you carry unfair lures here. I, ch I checked before it came. Um, this is um, this bait right here has won more tournaments for me in the last two years than, in, than all of the other baits um, combined. It sinks really slowly. It sinks in a perfectly horizontal manner. When the thing gets to the bottom and it hits the grass and the hooks hit the bottom or the hooks hit the grass, it stops. And it'll just sit right there, just like a, a pinfish trying to hide, something like that. But that's also something that I can, you know, I can cast and reel, cast and reel. I can really work the flats with it. Um, the same way with this guy. This is a chatterbait. Um, again, that's a bass thing that's making its way into, into salt water. It's a cast and reel sort of a thing. It's basically a jig head. It's got this goofy little bait on, blade on the front. Has anybody thrown a chatterbait before? That's a fun little bait. You throw it out there, and it's like a spinnerbait. When you reel it back in, that little blade on the front moves, and you can feel it. So it's like getting a hand massage while you're, you know, while you're fishing. It really a lot of vibration, sonic uh, signature. You know, fish make noise when they come through the water, and that thing makes a lot of noise. So um, that's a redfish killer right there. Um, what's that? I, I don't use a buzz bait in salt water, and there's no reason I, I just haven't. Yeah, there's no, uh, that, that would make a fantastic, uh, you know, redfish bait. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the little shrimps, that's the uh, um, the savage or the I mean, that's the voodoo, or the savage. I love those little those little shrimps. These things are made out of um, 
TPE, some kind of thermal plastic elastomer, I think is what it is. Man, they, they stretch like like uh, like crazy. I wish I could make tires out of this stuff. Um, they last a long time unless you get around puffers, and puffers will you know wear them out. But uh, you know they're they're fantastic little bait. Um, here's a great bonus tip. Um, we've all seen schools of minnows. You know, you're walking along the dock after having your seafood dinner and stuff, and you see a school of minnows, and you know they all flicker. You know, they make that flicker. When you're choosing bait colors, again, I don't necessarily think that fish can see subtle changes in color. They don't know the difference between purple and blue. But if I have a bait that's red and white or black and chrome, as that bait's coming through the water, it's showing them those two totally diverse colors, and it looks like a bait making that flicker. It's something that's more natural to them. Rather than having a bait that's all the same color, it may have the proper silhouette, but it's not showing them that, that flicker, that change in, you know, in, in variation in color. And whether it's black and chrome or blue and white or whatever, as long as there's two distinct colors in a bait, I think that's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's fantastic. And mo most lures are made that way. They're made with a darker back and a lighter belly. But, you know, if somebody says, well, you've got to have one that's got the red fins and the blue belly and the orange stripe, fish can't see that, man. Come on, you're kidding me. I can't even see that. But if it's got those two distinct colors, like red and white, my grandpa used his whole life, I, I think it makes a, it makes a difference. So. Popping corks. These are not for the tourists. This is a real deal. Um, quiz time. There are obviously two totally different corks, but can somebody tell me the specific difference between these two corks? Hands up. Y yes, sir. One pops. One pops. That's it. That's as easy as it is. One pops. This is a popping cork. This is a rattling cork. This one has typically has a, and this one's a custom made job. It's a it's a, actually a really small one. Has a concave top, and it pops. Did I give you a, a fish grip already? Don't you already have a fish grip? All right. Well, your choices are black or black. <laughs> It pops. Have you guys um, heard a, a trout pop or you've heard a snook pop? You've heard that, I mean, it, they pop. They absolutely pop. They don't rattle. They don't shake, shimmy, shake, and roll. They pop. I think the popping cork makes a huge, huge difference over a rattling cork. Now, that's not to say I won't use a rattling cork, but nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, I'm going to use a popping cork because I'm popping it. The proper way to use a popping cork is to make it pop. Um, more redfish tournaments are won with a popping cork than any other than any other lure. Not necessarily in Titusville and not necessarily Tampa, but redfish tournaments all over the United States with a popping cork. Um, we're blessed with having clear water. Not everybody else has got clear water. They've got stained water. They use that sound to attract fish. Um, pop, pop, pause. And that is a redfish tournament secret. Pop, pop, pause. Don't over pop, don't under pop. It's pop, pop, give it a pause. Pop, pop, and give it a pause. Pop, give it a pause. Um, you're allowing the fish to hear it and then find it, but you don't want to frighten them. You don't want to keep popping continuously. You don't want to gig one gigantic single pop. You want to give it that and then let it pause and then let it pause. But I want to hear the pop. No matter what distance it is, I want to hear the pop. I use a relatively short leader. <coughs> the fish is coming to the sound of the popping cork. He's looking up. This is basically a top water lure but I can use it in dingy water, or I can use it when they're not committing to a topwater lure. If I'm throwing a spook and they hit it all day and they won't eat it, I can put this thing on there. They'll come to the sound of it, but then they're going to find that little yummy morsel at the, uh, at the end of it. Guys say, well, isn't it supposed to touch the grass? No, man. My fish is not looking in the grass for a bait. He's looking at my popping cork for, for the bait, so I, I don't want it to be too far from the bait. So I'm talking maybe 18 inches, something like that. If I go 24 inches, it's because I just cut off too much leader. You know, it's going to typically be pretty short. And almost all of the time, I'm going to use a soft plastic underneath there, and hopefully I'm ha going to be able to use it non-weedless with, um, um, with a regular, like a J-hook a or something like that. I don't necessarily need, need it to be weedless at that, at that time. So uh, a worm, uh, the old worm hooks, you know, but a weedless hook would be, would be perfectly fine. I can actually push the hook through so that the barb is already sticking through, that kind of a thing, because, uh, you know, hopefully I'm not going to have to use, um, use a weedless. If I need to go weedless, I probably need to be using a different, um, a different bait. Um, I use a little bit heavier fluorocarbon. Um, most of my leaders, I use 20 pound for almost everything. I use 20 pound fluorocarbon. Um, I'll use some 12 pound fluorocarbon if I'm trout fishing for really spooky fish. I'll use 40 pound on this. The reason is, is I want it to be stiff. If you've used popping corks before, you cast it out, a lot of times it gets itself all wrapped up and now you're just mad as hell, you know, especially if you're using, um, you know, braid, you know. And braid is actually a really good choice here because I don't want the stretch. I want to be able to give it that jerk and that pop. Um, but it gets all wrapped up. If you use a stiff piece of fluorocarbon, 
it doesn't have the ability to get up there and get tied up. So I'll use a 40 pound, a piece of 40 pound fluorocarbon because this is not a subtle technique. This is a, you know, they're going to come and find it, you know, sort of a thing. Um, if I need, if the fish are spooky, I need to be using, you know, something different. Um, and here is the bonus tip where I talked about the soft plastic, you know, and being able to drop that on there. This is one of the ways that I'm going to do it um, right here. This is, a, this is a great way to add a, a lot of action to a, to a bait. Again, if I'm able to use it weedless, if I don't have a lot of weeds. And this right here is a trick that a lot of tournament anglers really would rather you not know. And that is my favorite. That's a, that's a little um, Rebel Papar. Uh, that thing makes a beautiful noise. I mean, it's a topwater lure, so, man, it makes a beautiful noise coming through the water. Pop, pop, pop. It's a nice, heavy, you know, thing. It makes a, you know, it's easy to cast. You know, it, it makes a nice noise when it, uh, when it hits the bottom. Just take the hooks off and tie it on. you got a, an, a fantastic, uh, you know, popping cork. These lures cost about seven bucks a piece or something like that. So does a popping cork. So. Yes, sir? So you just let it sit? You just pop, pop, let, let, let it sit down there? The reason, the reason that I'm using it weedless is because as I pop it, I've brought it to the surface, and now I want it to, to sink really slowly. Okay. And I'm thinking the fish is going to swim up. What was that, what was that noise? And he's going to see my little juicy bit sinking down, and he's going he's to grab that. Cool. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You take both hooks off of it like that? Yeah, no hooks because that tends to have a, have a twist. Every once in a while we'll have a fish that, you know, that'll want to grab it, but hopefully he's going to see my soft plastic before he grabs the, you know, the top water. And if he, even if he does, I'll give it another pop or two, and hopefully he's going to be able to, to, you know, to find it. So, um, you know, I've, had, I've, I've got popping corks with teeth marks in them. You know, yeah. so, you know they'll grab a popping cork sometimes. But hopefully eventually I'll catch that fish on the, on the soft plastic. So. On yes, the previous sir? slide you had the, uh, the, the topper with their, their rig with the wire between them. Oop. We've all seen the, the yep. yeah, we've all seen the, yep. the styrofoam ones that yep. you've plugged mm -hmm. through. Any preference, sir? Um, the only um, comment I can make about those is I do have a brand that I don't prefer okay. because I've had failures. Um, Bomber makes one that's titanium with loops in the end, and I've had those loops break. Yeah. Um, any of the others, um, some of them make a better sound um, than others. Uh, um, well, the, I was talking about the, 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 the plastic ones that actually don't have any rigging in between. I, 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 I really, I don't have a problem with the, having the, the weight on them, you know, if they're, if they're pre-rigged you know, in, that, in that fashion. The plastic ones, I think, are heavy, and I don't, I don't really like the noise that they make. Some of the hard, the hard plastic, um, the hard plastic ones, or the foam ones. The foam ones, yeah. The, uh, it makes it ma makes a good noise. It makes a good noise. But this little bit of extra rattle and the other noise That's with it, I don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This also with having the swivel on each end helps me with the twist. You know that kind of stuff. I will use the regular foam ones from time to time, but this is this is probably what I'm going to if I'm using a popping cork or something like that. Foam so. ones years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and it's something that's easy to slip on yeah. and slip off. So if you want to change, so yeah, absolutely. Just the, the, I stress the popper versus the uh, the rattling cork. That doesn't necessarily mean a rattling cork won't catch fish, but uh, you know, I, I, hopefully I've conveyed my my preference, the reasons for that for that popper. So yeah. Okay, we talked about we talked about that guy. Yeah, you get some really great action when you hook, put a hook right in the right in the front of that thing, man. You can really, but you got to let a fish eat. You know, at this point, you get really got to let him take it. So hopefully, you know, you're you get absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This is actually set up with a 40 pound leader. You know, this is a rig I took off of a you know off of a rod. So yeah, yeah, it's light enough. I'm going to give that thing a pop, pop, pause, and that that thing is going to sink. You know, really, really slowly, and you know, more times than not, you give it the pop, pop, and pause. Trout have a tendency to do something like playing with a Labrador and a, and, a, and a tennis ball. You have that tennis ball and you act like you're going to throw it and he gets ready. And he doesn't do anything, he just stops. And then you throw the tennis ball and he runs. Trout have, have a tendency to do the same thing with a lure. As soon as you give it a jerk, jerk, and it pauses, they stop and they look at that bait and they think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> and as soon as you give it that next jerk, they slam it. I mean, you, you guys have probably experienced the same thing. When you're pulling a lure, you pause for a second, and then, you know, as soon as you, you, you twitch it, they grab it. The same thing with a popping cork. Nine times out of ten, they don't hit it while I'm popping it. They don't hit it when I'm pausing it. But as soon as I go to move it again, as soon as that lure, lure moves a micron, that's when they grab it. It's like the lab with the tennis ball. You know, they're ready to pounce. So, Okay. Pre-fishing. Yes, this is an actual picture of my dining room table getting ready for a, a, you know a tournament here I got them I got a map going on here I'm getting all my gear ready that kind of stuff I've got my Google Maps you know up uh, doing you know doing this thing there um, whether you're fishing this weekend or whether you're getting ready for a tournament out of state or, or, or whatever um, pre-fishing is incredibly important and it's as easy as going on Facebook and re reading the reports or talking to the local shops you know that kind of a thing and this is something that I learned in, in fishing professional tournaments for years 75% of the pre-fishing is done before you get on the water. 
When you fish in a boat tournament, it saves you thousands of dollars in gas. I want to know what's going on before I ever get there, before I ever turn the key and before I ever go. I want to talk to as many people as I can. I want to get as many resources as I can possibly get to find out what's, what's going on. We're going to go to Mosquito Lagoon this weekend. I'm going to get on the Florida Sportsman Forum. I'm going to get on the Facebook you know, pages, that kind of stuff. And I'm going to find out you know, what's, what's been happening, north, south, east, west, that sort of a thing. Get a general, you know, a general idea. If I can approach it like eating a pizza backwards, I'm going to eat the crust first, and as I work my way in, I'm going to get to that fine point of exactly what I need, what I need to know. I may, not need, I may not find out exactly what lure, what bait, what depth, what time of day, what current, what, you know, that kind of, I may not find everything out you know, initially, but if I can find out what area, basically what depth, what is the water color, what is the water color here, what is the water color there, get that, yeah, it's, this is basic information that, that you guys know, but 75% of that is done before you ever put the kayak in the back of the truck. Find out all the information before you, you know, before you go. Um, Google Maps, uh, Microsoft World, you know, all that kind of stuff. Invaluable tool, absolutely invaluable tool for that. I use that um, exclusively. And as the next, uh, um, the next part of our series, um, we're going to use exactly Google Maps for, um, you know, for that. Um, that's a, that's an invaluable tool. Some of those um, photographs are older. Um, they're not. Uh, they're not all exact. When you're looking at the depths, or you're looking at the, the the grass types, that kind of stuff. But it really gets us in the uh, you know in in the ballpark. Um, and as we're doing with these next couple of sides slides, we're basically going to be pre-fishing, and we're going to be figuring uh, figuring this kind of stuff out. Thank you. I just have to get up at two o'clock in the morning. No worries. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. My my pleasure. My pleasure. I hope you enjoyed. Okay. Does anybody recognize where we are here? Pretty much everybody from here should know where we're at. If you do any, any salt, saltwater fish, there's a whale tail right there. That's the whale tail. I figured everybody here had fished this area or were familiar with the area or at least had heard of, of that area. So I chose this, um, this particular area. We're going to dissect this a little bit. We're going to talk about um, <coughs> this particular area. So we're going to pre-fish um, this area. and We're going to talk about some of the things that are there. Um, and I'm going to talk about the details. So you guys are going to be able to use this, you know, in your next, your next fishing trip. So we're going to talk about this area right here. We got uh, there are two launches. We got what Bio Lab is right over here, and then Eddy Creek, um, you know, is right over here, right? All right. We'll zoom in a little bit. Make does this make it a little more clear as to where we are? I think uh, is, is this Bio Lab? Bio Lab, yeah. That one. It's a little bit. And then we got Eddy Creek, um, you know, over here. I, I this is uh, since I'm a pedal drive, I typically don't um, launch here because this is shallow. It's tough for me to get across with a Hobie, so I typically launch here. But I fish this whole you know this whole area so it's you know either way is fine with me um okay we're going to zoom in a little bit um this is gal nipper um eddy creek over here again and this is part of the whale tail whale tail uh is, can we can we kill these lights because this is um uh we do kind of want to look at these these slides is that is that, is that possible because the variations in color and stuff would be fantastic Okay, uh, yeah, Eddy Creek here, this is, this, there's a little island right here, this is called Gal Nipper Point. This is all Gal Nipper um, here, um, so we're going we're gonna to focus on this area first. All right, now we just zoomed in to, uh, to the point there. We can see a boat right here, so this gives us a, a scale. That's, we're going to figure that's a 20-foot boat, so we can kind of get a scale of what's going on. We've got a couple of different things going on that we want to we wanna focus on. Vegetation types. Um, <coughs> It is kind of difficult to see. Uh, we've got, we actually have three different types of, uh, of vegetation going on here. We have the normal grass, which is most of the stuff that's out in here. We've got most of the stuff that's out in here. And actually in this particular area, we've got, ah, uh, it, yeah. we've got, it's hard, it, 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 it is, a, it can still be a little bit more difficult to see, but there's, there's, we've got that red grass here and we've got the red grass here. Does anybody know what red rolly grass is? Have you guys seen that out on the water? It looks like it's red. You know, it's the orangish red and it kind of moves around. We call it red rolly grass because it just rolls around. It's like tumbleweeds, just giant, you know, patches of this red, funky weed, basically. So this particular area has got some going on right here that changes from time to time. We've got three different types of vegetation going on. We've got the regular vegetation. There's some darker patches in here. So we've got a second type of vegetation. And then we've got the red rolly grass. So we've got basically all three types of, red, of that vegetation in the same in the same area. It's also pretty easy to see that we've got a wash going on right here. The typical um, wind that comes down uh, um, 
uh, Mosquito Lagoon from the north. So we've got a little, we've got, we've got, if there's going to be any wind driven current, it's going to be around this area right here. We've got water movement. When you walk into the foyer at Publix, it smells like bread. It smells like the bakery. You know, I mean, it smells good. Grocery stores do that on purpose. They actually pump the uh, vent from the bakery area into the foyer. So when you walk in, you smell it. You're like, oh man, I'm hungry. And you want to buy more, more groceries. Water current does the same thing. It's stirring up the bottom. It's stirring up what's, you know, what's going on. It'll make the fish want to feed more. So that's why people say, oh, I want to fish you know, during tide movements, this and that kind of a thing. The water's moving. It makes the fish want to eat. So if I've got an area that's got water movement, like here, <coughs> that's an area that I want to focus on. A couple of other things that we've got going on. You see all the prop scars. There's no prop scars here. Well, that tells me this is probably shallower than this area right here. Also, the fact that this is dense grass and this is spotty patchy grass. This is probably a deeper, a deeper area right here. This area is probably tidal because grass doesn't grow quite as much. And I say tidal. We know the Mosquito Lagoon isn't necessarily tidal, but the water can move, you know, move up and down. The grass can't grow out of, out of water, so that's probably what we got going on here. So this is probably our shallowest area. So we have a depth change here. Somewhere along in here, we have a depth change as well. Out here, it's a little bit deeper. We're going to have the same thing, you know, out in this area. So I've got different depths going on. I've got different types of vegetation going on. Which one do I fish? I don't know. But I've got a couple of different things that are going on. This is, this is where that 25% of my pre-fishing is going on. People say, man, the whale tail's going off. There's redfish all over the place. They may not tell you exactly which grass they're feeding on or exactly which depth, but I know which area to be in now, and I know the different things that I need to look for. If I fish over here for a little while and I get no bites, and I start getting bites in this area, what depth am I at? Oh, I'm in four feet. Okay, I'm going to concentrate on four feet. So wherever I fish on this flat, I may focus on that four feet rather than the two feet. Time of day can make a difference, that sort of thing as well. If there is any wind-driven current, this will be a fantastic area. Great, amb great ambush point. Talking about ambush, ambush points. All of us, a lot of us from college, all hang, hang out at the bars, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, we, we've all done that. Where's the best place to set yourself up to meet women in a bar? Or by the bathroom, by the ladies' room. Right? It's a great, amb <laughs> great ambush point. So me and my buddies, we get a table somewhere near the ladies' room because at some point, Every woman is going to pass by that, that table. Ambush points. Predators are no different. We're, we're all predators, right? So if I've got any kind of current moving around this point right here, great ambush points right here. Predators are going to know that. You know, they're, they're, going, to, they're going to have that sense. They're, they're going to know that. So that, that's a great ambush point. So I've got this wonderful flat here, shallow water. I want to try that out. Maybe the fish are moving back and forth because there's a uh, hermit, or a uh, horseshoe crab hatch going on. So maybe I've got, you know, I've got fish moving back and forth in this area. Maybe they're actually concentrating in the deeper water because it's cloudless blue sky and um, uh, the water is perfectly clear. So they want to be in deeper water to protect themselves. So maybe I want to concentrate on this deeper water. So um, the changes, you know, in these things change from grass to no grass. That's a great, that's a great ambush place, place as well. People always talk about fishing the potholes for trout. Oh man, I fish around the potholes, fish around the potholes. Those are great ambush points because as a fish swims from the grass across the pothole back into the grass, um, you know, with this would be, you know, enormous, huge pothole, but basically the same thing. As a pinfish swims across that, he's exposed. You know, he's like, a, like the, the video game with the ducks, you know, flying by. That's basically what he's doing. Does that mean a trout is sitting in the pothole? Well, no. A pinfish saw him, you know, before he even got near there. They're stationed around the outside of that, around the outside of the dance floor you know, waiting for that pinfish to, you know, to go across. So if I'm going to, if I'm going to cast towards those potholes, I'm probably going to set up myself somewhere else and I'm going to cast across, you know, in lots of different directions because the trout is not here. He's out here somewhere waiting for that pinfish to cross so he can, you know, he can dash in there and get it. So we've got you know, a couple of different places that we can, we can fish there. All right, next slide, we're going to pull out a little bit. Uh, we've got a totally different sort of an experience going on here at, uh, at Pelican Island. So that's where we're going to zoom in to next. All right, this is the shoreline here at Pelican Island. We have, a, it's a lot more obvious here that we have three different types of grass going on. Here you can actually see there's some red tint. On my computer screen, it's really, really red. Red tint here, red tint here, red tint here. You can tell by the texture it's two different kinds of grass. But then I also have this lighter grass, like in the, in, inside the potholes here, and then of course all this, all this dark grass. So again, I've got the three different types of grass you know, going on. But I also have a lot of potholes you know, and things like that. I don't have any prop scars over here. This is probably deeper. There's a few prop scars over here. It's probably shallower. So I've got some sort of a depth 
you know, going on here. And then, of course, it shallows up again somewhere near the, you know, near the shoreline. So again, I've got a, a couple of different things going on here. What I don't have in this particular area is potholes. If people are telling me, oh, man, we've been catching big trout on the potholes, you know, all, all week, this may be an area that I want to omit and move back over to Gallon Nipper because there's a lot more potholes there. So um, there are some areas that are a little less, less dense. So, you know, I may, I may not totally discount this area, but, you know, I, I probably want to spend my time more productively in the, uh, in the other area. Um, if I'm catching more fish in the dark grass, I'm obviously going to stay in the dark grass. If I catch a fish near the red roller grass, I'm going to stay near the red roller grass. So it's those kind of things that you need to, you know, you need to figure out. Um, once you're, you know, once you're on the water. Okay, this is the whale tail. You know, we recognize the whale tail. This is a, come on guys, this is a super highway. Look at this. Look at the, I mean, this is, if I could, if I could have gotten my crayons out and made a depth chart, I couldn't have done it any better than this. I've got this distinct drop right here, this huge depth right here, and then it flattens back up, and of course, Gallinipper's back over here. So this is a super highway. If you guys have ever fished this area on a weekend, you will see a half a dozen at least guideboats work in this area right here. Why? Because it's full of fish. It's absolutely full of fish. This over here is, you know, is a foot deep. It's not very deep at all. This is absolutely a highway. Stake out, fish the shallow water, fish the deep water. But at some point in time, especially big redfish, the big, the big bull redfish, they're going to use this because they're protected. Boat traffic is up above them. They're in a the depth of water. If they can use it in the middle of the day, whatever. This is absolutely a fantastic uh, super highway. And it shows you also some differences in vegetation at the different depths, um, you know, as well. Um, wind driven. If I've got wind moving one direction or another, maybe this is a fantastic, um, you know, area to focus. If I've got water um, washing over, you know, this direction, if it's coming out of the, like a wintertime, uh, you know, sort of a, a pattern, northwest wind, it's going to be all frothy and, you know, whatever right here. It's going to have the bait all mixed up and pushed on that side. Man, this is an oh, absolutely fantastic place to, you know, look for those, um, you know, mullet and, you know, things that are, that are all confused and mixed up. Um, this is a great place for redfish to wait and, uh, and hang out for that. And this is basically just the north side of, um, of, uh, of whale tail. And we've got, again, these distinct lines where you can see three different um, types of vegetation growing at three different depths. Oh, you think, well, the grass grows everywhere. Well, look right here. This is pretty evident that at different depths you can have different types of vegetation. And this is a great place uh, you know, for that. This is a much more subtle uh, drop. Again, this is about a foot, a, a foot deep, maybe two feet deep. Um, it's a much more subtle, much more subtle drop. Um, on a calm day or if the wind's blowing out of the, uh, out of the southeast, you know, maybe this area is confused and there's going to be more fish you know, along this area. Again, I've got another little area on this side. It's really, really shallow from here over to, to Biolab, but I've got sand on the bottom here. It's obviously a little bit deeper here. It's actually, there's, a, there's an area here that's four or five feet deep uh, and actually can be deeper. That's a great little um, highway for fish to, um, you know, for fish to use as well. So um, you got different differences in uh, vegetation at, at different depths. Um, if, you, if you're finding you're getting more bites in 3, 4, 5, 8, 12, 2, whatever feet of water, it's going to be the same basically anywhere, uh, you know, on that, uh, on that flat, whether it's here or whether it's over at Gal Nipper or, you know, anywhere else. If you're finding the fish in 4 feet, if you change locations, chances are whatever those conditions are going to be, you know, pretty much um, the same thing in the 4 feet, um, the four feet there. So that's our, um, my small uh, version of uh, dissecting the flats. 2 hours and 15 minutes, I didn't do too bad. I was right at... Uh, right at right at two hours. So. Yeah, not too bad. So, questions? Yes. Uh, I got the uh, elite five mm -hmm. uh, this year. Been playing around with it. When you look at uh, uh, Google Earth, and I found a way to import those into uh, low range. Right. Um, how accurate, from your experience, are you finding that if you mark a spot on a map and you say, you know, that looks like a good spot, I want to go there, and you put it into the depth of uh, the um, GPS. Are you using you're using the GPS? You're using the latitude, longitude um, numbers from uh, Google Maps and putting that into. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're going to be you're going to be, um, it, it, especially if you can go out all four you know decimal places. Absolutely. If you go out three three decimal places or four decimal places, you're going to get within you know a meter. You know, basically. Yeah. 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 I know there's a lot of information, but come on, there's got to be some questions, you know, right? Yeah, yes, sir. Do you anchor your kayak? Uh, sometimes, um, typically, if I'm fishing a flat, I do a lot of a lot of drifting. But um, I will, you know, there's some situations where I want to fish an area like um, where we were talking about. Let's say here, yeah. um, I I use a, a stakeout, stakeout pole. Yeah, I use a stakeout pole. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're this kind of situations, a lot of times I will I'll, I'll stake out here and 
you know, fishing area. Or if I am drifting across a flat, like the gal nipper, you know, we were looking at that nice flat there. If I'm drifting across a flat, get a couple of bumps, get a couple of bites, I'll stake out and I'll concentrate on the area a little bit. I may pull this, you know, or if I got a lot of wind or something like that, I usually use it to control my drift more than anything because I do more um, on a flat. I'll use, I'll do more drifting than I will, um, you know, staying in one, you know, in one location. So. Well, using this, using, yeah, well, the stakeout pole, you know, is, is you know, is, is key. And I have a, a very um, high-tech uh, stakeout pole. It actually is an old, um, what do you call it, a Hawaiian sling that the tip rusted off of with a, bun <laughs> with, with a bungee cord. That's my, that's my stakeout pole. They make some fantastic stakeout poles from $30, 40 50 80 dollars, you know, on up. So, but I use, use a stakeout pole, yeah. So, yeah. atypically, do you, like, when you get into an area, are you, you're not slight fishing, mostly. It's more like I got a feeling I've got something out here, and you're gonna test the waters, see if you get bites. Yeah, I, 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 what got two, that, that's something that I'm going to have to uh, really decide on. Hopefully, my pre-fishing is going to get me in the ballpark, but I'm going to have to decide, um, you know, as the um, as the sun comes up. Typically, if I'm going to sight fish, I need a little bit of sunlight. I need to be able the light to be able to penetrate the water. Um, so first thing in the morning, um, you know, I'm going to be blind casting, you know, as the sun rises or before the sun rises. You know, I'm I'm sort of search fishing, you know, getting my location, and as the sun comes up, then I'll. I'll uh, ascertain the water clarity is, you know, is there enough sunlight for me to be able to sight cast, that kind of a thing. I do a lot of standing in the kayak and I do a lot of, a lot of sight fishing when I'm, when I'm able to. And, uh, do, you know, it just depends on the area, the location, you know. But if I can, if I can sight fish, yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially the, the lagoon, do a lot of sight fishing, in, you know, in the, in the lagoon. Because the water is typically clear, the water that I'm fishing is typically shallow. And, I, and, the, and uh, especially if I'm red fishing, you know, the, the fish are schooled, so I'm able to see them. Um, I'm not I'm not a um, an advanced uh, sight caster. You know I don't have really good vision, so um, you know it, it is one of my weaker my weaker points. But um, I, you know I, I do enjoy it if I can do it. You know you know I will. So. so you tend to do maybe especially in the summer uh, with the heat coming on in the morning you're, you're hitting the shallows and then as the day or the morning progresses you're going out. To the probably using you're probably going to deeper water. Yeah, probably deeper. If if the water's clear and it's a bluebird sky. If it's an overcast day, I may be able to throw a top water all day. If it's overcast and the water's dirty, so but I, I think about my eyes and the fish's eyes and if they need to hide then I, you know, I, I they, then I, I need to uh, be fishing in deeper water, so. Yeah, if uh, typically we'll start my morning uh, a, a normal day, I'm going to have probably three rods um, tied on. I'm probably going to have a top water tied on. I'm probably going to have a, 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 a soft plastic probably unweighted and then my third rod is going to have um the lure du jour whatever the you know the tips have you know have told me you know i need to be using a, a purple whiz bang you know whatever then I'll, I'll probably be you know have one of those tied on so but i'm going to have a top water and a soft plastic tied on at some point during the day the top water is going to come off and something else is going to go on there because unless it's an overcast day i'm not going to be able to throw the top water all day i'm gonna throw i'm gonna stop throwing top water eight or nine o'clock you know the sun is high enough that you know the fish are you know they're going to be they're not going to be looking up because the sun's bothering their eyes they're going to be focusing on at some other depth so yeah really good information today yeah, sure yeah, appreciate this it. Was, yeah. this was, i gotta say this is one of the best ones we've ever had i appreciate it yeah yeah, yeah. my opinion thank you <laughs> thanks i appreciate it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah it, Anything else? You know, I, I got a, I got a two and a half hour ride back. I'd rather answer questions. I'd rather question answer questions now. Yeah. Always, yes. Always when I find trout, it's always like if I find a big trout, it's high school. Yeah. It seems like and if I find trout, they're always you know, like on the smaller end where I'm getting a lot of bites. It's fun. The males tend to be um, social, where the females are not. They're very singular because they're territorial. For food, you know, more more than anything, they're going to stake out an area on a flat that's their that their property, and they don't want other fish coming in, other trout coming in, because, you know, there's not as there's not you know not enough food for all of them. But the males tend to be a little more social, and you'll catch them more in, in schools. So. Do they, I mean, if I scoop one, do they come back? I, I find out that you know redfish, if I'm kind of paddling and I see a big one, he sees me, runs out, I go and drink a beer, then I come back, and I work that same area. I, I think I think a trout actually is a spookier fish, and I hate to say, but I think they're actually a little bit smarter. Um, if you spook a trout, your odds of catching that trout go to almost zero. You know, after that, even if she returns to that same basic area, um, yeah, yeah, she's she's yeah, yeah, almost almost zero. So yeah, 
Yeah, for what length of time, you know, come back in the afternoon or two hours, I, you, know, I, you know, I don't really know. But typically, she's moved off enough and she's become wary that, that, that a boat or a kayak is there, that she's, um, you know, she's going to be even spookier, you know, the, uh, the next time. So. I think they can imprint more easily than a redfish can. I think that, um, uh, you know, I've, I've sight casted, you know, some big, beautiful trout and I cannot make, I could, can't make them eat a live bait, you know, but I think they know fishing line, a hook, a, a kayak, don't eat right now, just wait, you know, whatever, that kind of a thing. I think that, that a trout has the ability to imprint more than a, than a redfish does. So, and I think snook the same way. Redfish are kind of dumb, I, I, you know, I mean, let's just, let's face it. Um, I had a friend not too long ago, um, a wrench. He had a, I was like a, you know, a, a 16th inch box in wrench, fished with it all day and caught, um, caught redfish with it all day <laughs> with a wrench literally put a hook on put a hook on it and and caught, caught with the wrench. So just to prove you know that he could well it's shiny and coming through the water and you know they're they're impulse feeders redfish are typically schooling fish so i have to eat it first before my buddies you know get to it so a lot of times you know they'll they'll impulse eat before um you know before trout or anything else so, so um if you catch one redfish would you most likely to stick around do they travel alone Redfish typically are schooling fish, so where there's one, there's typically, you know, uh, there's typically others, and typically there are going to be others of a similar size, and that as the fish gets smaller, that becomes more and more true. If you catch a 30-inch redfish, the pot is probably a few fish, whereas if you catch an 18-inch redfish, there may be a hundred, right. you know. And that doesn't mean they're going to stay in the same place. Right. Redfish, uh, more so than trout and more so than snook, redfish move. You know, that doesn't mean in the middle of the day when it's hot that they won't lay up. I mean, I've I've yeah. seen them. And I, I thought they were dead. You know, they're just they're laying there, and I'm like, what are you doing? Um, but for the most part, they they constantly move. But they'll work. They'll work. Um, like I say, a similar depth or a similar similar area, um, pretty much you know consistently. So if they're if they're cruising in you know in three feet of water, the the chances are. You know, they may come back to that same area and work that, you know, that same area. So I've seen, I've seen schools, you know, just work the same area for, I've actually seen schools in the same area for two or three weeks. You know, in the same area. So they, yeah, they keep back. And, but then they'll relocate and relocate yeah. in another, you but know. Work an area for the Thousand Islands. Hmm. We went out there and it was like one, and then a catfish and a catfish. And we didn't know what, what we scared them off, or we just sat there all day. Well, the red, the, they're going to, they're typically going to be in pods or schools. And I, you know, that's not to say that there won't be just, you know, just a single here or there, mm -hmm. but they are, they are going to be moving. If you stay on one particular point and fish there all day and say, well, I caught one redfish. Well, there may have been a school of 20 that came through. You just caught the first one or the last one. They're still in the area, but they have, you know, they've, they've moved around. That, that's, that's, a, that's a, um, something that uh, comes with um, experience and reading the water. Is the bait, you know, over here doing something different than it was doing over there? Well, you know, have the, have the fish moved, reading the water, that kind of stuff. So, so you know how, like, you know, certain fish, like reds, they'll follow rays, and I wonder if catfish follow reds. I've, <laughs> si I've sight casted an awful lot of catfish thinking they were redfish. You know, yeah. they, I mean, they follow the bait. I'm wondering the if there's, like, they, a progression in that They, 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 um, <laughs> they shadow, you know, I mean, they, 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 yeah. yeah, they're they're not they're not dissimilar from a redfish in their feeding yeah. habits, you know, and stuff. So yeah, yeah, they'll do. Yeah. I've noticed that a lot though. As soon as I see some rays, then I start seeing reds. Some reds, yeah, because they're stirring up the they're bottom. They're the eating. Thing. Yeah, yeah, the red, the rays yeah. are stirring up the bottom. The reds are following, picking it up. Uh, schools of mullet the same way. A big mullet, school of mullet in shallow way. water. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll work a school of mullet to death. I will beat them to death looking for the redfish that I know you know see, is yeah, in there. When I'm, when I'm following mullet schools, I'm always thinking they're going after the mullet. But no, they're looking for the little right, fishy bits, sure the little up. crabs yeah. and shrimp yeah. and things like that. Yeah, that's what they're looking for. You're seeing, you know, how you get into uh, an area and all of a sudden the mullet are all over the place. So you're saying you're going to work in there because... I'm casting right in there with that mullet, okay. um, looking for those redfish. And typically I'm going to use something that's uh, on the bottom. Again, a soft plastic or something that's going to orient to the bottom because they're like cattle eagers following cows around. You yeah. know, they're, they're, as, the, as the mullet move along... Mullet are eating the algae or whatever. Those redfish are w waiting for a shrimp or a crab to, to hop up and you know and grab it. They're not looking up, trying to eat a mullet or trying to eat something fleeing. They're you know they're more focused on the on the bottom. I catch a lot of trout around the mullet schools as well, and I think they follow them for the same reason because as the mullet are moving along, pinfish or something else you know will, yeah. will hop out too. So the predators know. So yeah. I think we're keeping them. Past yeah. Them, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Wow. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. Sure. My pleasure. Good job. Thanks, I got one quick question. What do you? What is this for that you use? This is your 
You said your lion snip? This is a, it's called a snips. Yep, it's um, oh, okay. it's a it's a line it's a line cutter, but man, it cuts braid like you know like butter, and it has the built-in little. Okay. Yeah, it's like 12, 13, 14 bucks or something, and it's all stainless, and they last a long time. Most cutters they don't last very long, but these last. Yeah, yeah, they they do they, they last a long time. That's a great little cutter.